I was taking a break from my exhausting life when I rented out a cabin in the woods of rural Washington State. My name is Jasper McGraw, and living a corporate rat race had worn me thin. This retreat, an escape from that tedious routine, was exactly what I needed. The evening I arrived at the cabin, I introduced myself to a couple of my neighboring renters. There was Terry Bronson, a real gruff-looking man with an encyclopedic knowledge about the local woods and some conspiracy theories. And then Michelle Clayton, a yoga teacher who decided to try teaching her classes remotely amidst the forest's inspiring peace. For the first few days, our discussions were mundane, filled with bits of humor and casual banter about living life off the grid. Terry's stories were wild-sounding, but nothing that could make me believe in anything outlandish. Early one morning, after having accompanied Terry on a brief fishing trip, we returned with some sizable catches for lunch. As we began cleaning the fish together back at the cabin, Terry accidentally chopped off his finger. His cry of pain echoed across the dense forest as blood spurted from his hand. Shocked by what had just happened, Michelle and I sprayed water on Terry's wound to clean it out and wrapped his hand tightly with a cloth to stop the bleeding. We tried calling for help but failed. All our phones were unable to receive or make calls. Shaken but determined, we decided to head into town to get Terry medical assistance. Halfway down an overgrown path leading into civilization, we stumbled upon an eerily twisted scene, an abandoned campsite with torn tents and burnout fire pits scattered around it. The stench of decaying food mixed with an odd metallic scent filled our nostrils as blood splatter decorated nearby rocks and trees like grotesque art. Despite our instincts urging us to leave immediately, we couldn't tear our eyes away. Terry limply gestured towards an unusual track next to the campsite, a mixture of dark debris and claw marks gouged out of the ground. At that moment, we heard what sounded like branches cracking in the distance. Our hearts raced as Michelle whispered, We should go now. Unsettled by the ominous scene before us, we hurriedly picked up our pace. Each step offered a confusing mix of growing anxiety and desperation to find safety for our friend Terry. Shadows seemed to dance around us. Trees loomed menacingly above as if entrapping us in a wicked embrace. As we neared the town, finally spotting reassuring glimmers of civilization, everything shifted. The forest's ambience changed from haunting to predatory. The air grew colder and movements along the ground's crust caught our eyes. A guttural roar tore through the thick silence consuming the woods. Deeper within its confines, a creature that defied explanation revealed itself, its skin shredded and spliced with twisted muscle fibers barely containing bloodied bones that protruded outward like horn-laced barbed wire. Veins pulsated under layers of seething flesh, framing haunting black eyes that seemed to stare into our very souls. Oozing scabs and decaying teeth held inside a perpetually hungered maw completed its horrifying visage. Terror coursed through me as I watched it approach with unnatural speed and agility despite its hulking frame. The creature was malevolent incarnate, a creature from nightmares spawned within these woods. Seeing it set everything into motion, we didn't have a choice anymore. We need to go, now! I screamed at my friends. We scrambled past bushes, over fallen branches, and even slipped through waterlogged marsh as that sinister monster pursued us in frenzied rage. I saw Michelle half carrying Terry further ahead but still struggling painfully with his injury from earlier. Desperation fueled our will to live as the creature drew closer and closer, driven by a predatory instinct to kill. It felt like an eternity of breathless sprinting before we could see the edge of town. Those glimmers of safety seemed almost foreign against my racing heartbeat and the thick shadows that chased us relentlessly. 
As the distance between us and the vicious creature grew smaller, reality set in. We couldn't outrun it forever. Michelle, still aiding Terry, practically dragged him forward, but their weakened state only further slowed our progress. In a moment of nerve-wracking realization, I knew that if we kept going like this, we were all as good as dead. Calling for help was our last hope. I quickly pulled out my phone, hands shaking, and dialed 911. Desperation filled my voice as I frantically explained our situation to the operator. Although noticeably confused, she promised help was on its way. As we continued our frantic escape, the creature drew closer, leaving a path of destruction in its wake, uprooted trees and gnarled bushes strewn about. Our lungs burned while fear drove us forward. Suddenly, bright lights pierced through the darkness ahead. Shouts rang out as several armed officers emerged from behind their vehicles, pointing their weapons at the beast behind us. He's right there! Shoot! I yelled. Their shots echoed against the night as bullets struck the creature with little effect. It only seemed to grow angrier with each impact. Seizing an opportunity for a brief respite, we ducked behind a squad car while officers continued their assault on the relentless monster. Terry winced at every movement he made while Michelle's eyes darted around for any more possible threats. One officer stepped up to us and quickly assessed Terry's injuries as his colleagues continued their fight against the monstrous creature a distance away. Paramedics are on the way, he assured us in a firm but calming voice. The feeling of relief swept over me momentarily before reality came crashing back when roars of fury erupted around us. The creature had not given up its pursuit. It lunged at the officers. Their weapons seemed useless against it. With horrifying fascination, I watched one soldier fall to the ground, his screams replaced by a sickening crunch. Time seemed to slow down as more officers were caught in the relentless grasp of the creature. I realized that we couldn't wait for backup anymore. Time was running out. I turned to Michelle and Terry, and together, we made a break for it once more. The remaining officers provided cover as we ran towards the edge of town. Buildings grew larger in our view, and we were so close to safety for it felt like hours since we had stepped away from security. The creature continued its bloodthirsty chase, never once faltering despite its numerous injuries. Finally, just as the creature was about to catch up with us, we stumbled onto a crowded street filled with bewildered inhabitants. The crowd separated in fear at the sight of both us and our violent pursuer. Luckily for us, our sudden appearance on the populated street had attracted even more law enforcement officials who moved swiftly into action. Bright lights shone upon the beast, disorienting it briefly. Multiple officers aimed their firearms at it, shooting repeatedly while others tackled it head-on. Amidst the chaos, we took shelter in an ambulance that had arrived on the scene. As paramedics worked on Terry's injured leg and exhaustion overtook Michelle and me, I watched through blurry eyes as officers subdued the terrifying beast. The days that followed were filled with questions from both law enforcement officials and acquaintances back home. While they tried relentlessly to uncover what had spurred that monstrous creature's existence, no reasonable conclusions were drawn. Only fear remained. It wasn't long before life started to return to normal, or at least what passed for normal after an experience of terror like ours. And though no one mentioned it out loud, I knew it haunted everyone who had witnessed it, that injured officer who would no longer walk among us, the gory visuals of that night forever embedded in our memories, the danger that had lurked in our once peaceful town. We knew we'd never forget the screams, the pain, and the life that was lost in our fight to survive. Each one of those moments had become a part of us, 
a reminder of how close we'd come to death's door. My name is Bartholomew Rigby, and I live alone in a small cabin nestled deep within the forests of Oregon. The cabin used to belong to my grandfather, and after his passing, I decided to move in for some solitude away from the bustling city life. I didn't have any neighbors in sight for miles, and the closest town was a 45-minute drive away. Life was simple yet content with a small vegetable garden by my humble abode and occasional hunting trips. One early morning, while working on growing my small army of tomatoes, I noticed something strange, a peculiar stench lingering in the air. Unfazed at first and thinking it was probably just some animal's doing, I continued my gardening. It wasn't until later when I stepped into the woods for a hunt that the magnitude of that stench dawned upon me. Several trees had dark claw marks on their trunks carved as though they'd been freshly attacked with some kind of massive knife. As the days passed, blood-curdling screams echoed in the night leading to several sleepless nights for me. The forest felt invaded by something unnatural, devoid of its earlier calm aura. Even the chirping crickets fell silent after sunset. Animals in the vicinity were scarce, making my hunting trips unfruitful, and the unshakable feeling that something was watching me never left. Two weeks later, Alondra Vasquez, a waitress from town who'd become good friends with me over occasional coffee chats during my grocery runs, called to say she'd visit after her shift ended. An avid birdwatcher herself, Alondra wanted to see if she could spot any rare species during her brief stay at my cabin. When Alondra arrived just before sunset, she was visibly out of breath and visibly shaken by something she couldn't quite make sense of. Between huffs and puffs caused by her frantic sprint from her car to my cabin, she described strange howling sounds emanating from the woods and something darting in and out the trees around her. We checked the surrounding area with caution, armed with only a flashlight and hunting rifle for protection. The search only bore the gruesome discovery of Alondra's car, now dented and scratched beyond recognition, as if it had been mauled by an animal fueled by immense rage. Fearful and without any transportation to leave, we returned to my cabin, deciding it best to lock ourselves in for the night. We made sure all doors were secure and windows were boarded up. The lingering sense of dread draped itself onto us both like a suffocating mist, as whispers of doubt danced in our minds if the hideous monstrosity outside was aware of our refuge. Our solace shattered with the gut-wrenching stench from before penetrating through the cabin's walls. That's when we saw it a grotesque creature pressed against one of the windows across from us, staring deeper into our souls. Its bulging eyes stretched unnaturally wide across its disfigured face, while razor-sharp teeth protruded from jaws seemingly unhinged. Ears like those of a mangled bat twitched erratically as droplets of drool dripped off jagged jaws, flashes of metal faintly visible on its claws that tightly gripped the window frame. The feeling in my bones told me that whatever this monstrosity was, we wouldn't survive another night with it lurking close by. Frantically, I searched for another way out or perhaps something to fend off the creature, all while Alondra muttered haphazard prayers under her breath. And then it hit me, my grandfather used to have an escape tunnel built under his cabin for such emergencies. Desperate to break free from this relentless terror, I threw open a trapdoor concealed under an old rug and motioned Alondra to follow me. Heaving a sigh of relief, I felt the initial sense of safety descend upon us. But as we climbed down into the tunnel, we heard the agonizing sound of shattering glass followed by the heavy thuds of the creature forcing its way into the cabin. The scent of death filled our nostrils as we scrambled through the pitch-black tunnel, 
listening closely to the muted echo of our own frantic footsteps. We continued our frantic crawl through the tunnel, our chests heaving as we gasped for air. The only sound we could hear was our own breathing and the distant thuds from the creature trying to track us down. Alondra whispered to me, her voice shaking. What do we do now? I remembered that the escape tunnel would lead us to a small shed in the woods, a place where my grandfather had stored old tools and equipment. I knew there had to be something useful in there to help us fend off the beast whether it was a knife or a sturdy piece of wood. Once we reached the shed, I told Alondra, We can find something to protect ourselves with, and then we'll call for help. After what felt like hours of crawling, we finally emerged into the cold night air. The molded wooden shed stood before us, cobwebs decorating its edges and moss creeping up its walls. We both slipped inside our eyes darting around in search of anything that could be used for defense. I found an old rusty shovel and handed it to Alondra, gripping an axe myself. We tried using our phones to call for help, but there was no signal where we were. The decision was made we had to make our way back towards civilization and find someone who could help. Before stepping out of the shed, we paused for a moment listening carefully for any sign of the creature. Silence greeted us and I couldn't help but feel relieved. Maybe it hadn't followed us after all. With weapons in hand and determination in our hearts, Alondra and I began making our way back through the woods under the cover of night. Every snap of a twig or rustle of leaves sent terror coursing through my veins and then it happened a blood-curdling growl echoed through the trees behind us. We both panicked and rushed forward as fast as our legs would carry us, but it wasn't long before the creature caught up. The scream that tore from Alondra's lips stabbed my heart as she was grappled by the vicious beast. Its claws slashed through her clothes and skin, her blood staining the damp earth beneath us. Desperate, I swung my axe at the creature, striking it across the face. The force of the blow caused it to stagger and release Alondra from its grip. She lay on the ground, gasping and injured as I continued to fight off the monstrous being. The chase went on for what felt like miles until we finally stumbled upon a road illuminated with street lights. We could see a small house in the distance lights glowing softly through its windows a beacon of hope. As we ran towards it, I glanced back over my shoulder and saw that the creature had stopped short at the edge of the woods. It stared at us, its eyes burning with hate but staying within its domain. Maybe it couldn't bear to enter into human territory. We banged on the door of house, desperate for help and soon found ourselves being pulled inside by a frightened couple who heard our screams. As they tended to our wounds and called for an ambulance, I noticed Alondra shivering on their living room couch. In that moment, as help rushed towards us and our lives began to stabilize once more, one thing became crystal clear to me. We had barely made it out alive. In our recovery later on, Alondra and I decided to never set foot near my grandfather's cabin again and made a promise never to speak of the grisly night that brought us face to face with the horrifying beast that haunted those woods. As for my grandfather's warnings now we knew they were real, a grim lesson in never doubting words spoken in fear ever again. There was something about living in a cabin in the woods that always appealed to me. The solitude, the smell of pine and wet earth, the chance to be alone with my thoughts. That was until I stumbled upon a gruesome discovery. My name is Isaac Thompson, a quiet introvert who prefers staying away from crowded places. One evening, I returned home with my groceries in hand when I noticed the door was ajar. 
puzzled and slightly alarmed, I entered, cautious of my surroundings. To my horror, there were blood stains on the floor leading into the bedroom. As I followed the sickening trail of blood, I hesitated before opening the door. Immediately, I spotted Roger, my neighbor who always had a joke to lighten any moment. His body lay mangled and contorted in twisted ways, barely recognizable. The room reeked of blood and death. I couldn't help but gag as panic enveloped me. Doing what felt right at that time, I called 911 and got in touch with the sheriff's department. Nameless dread surged through me as their urgent voices told me to be calm while waiting for them to arrive. Something made them take forever, or at least that's how it felt as time passed. Sheriff Hollard showed up with his deputy Marcus looking unsettled by the gruesome scene that greeted them inside my cabin. They questioned me extensively about my whereabouts before finding Roger's body and insisted that we wait outside while they properly documented everything. A sudden rustling caught our attention as we stood by the entrance of the woods near my cabin. Nervously glancing around, we noticed footprints, not human ones, but they appeared distorted and elongated which sent shivers through every one of us present there. Inching closer to analyze these unusual tracks cautiously, Sheriff Hollard whispered with a sharp intake of breath. Marcus, radio for backup and send a patrol car toward the Henderson farm. It looks like whatever made these tracks headed that way. The deputy took out his radio and relayed the orders as he tried not to show any fear, but his voice betrayed him. When we saw an animal corpse mangled beyond recognition near those tracks, I couldn't help but feel waves of unease flood my body. I turned to the sheriff and asked, Do you think this creature will come back? You stay inside the cabin. We'll inform you if there's any danger. Sheriff Hollard warned, firmly gripping his gun. That night, as I sat inside the now clean cabin, I couldn't help but think about what could have been responsible for Roger's gruesome demise. The eerie silence was unsettling, and my attempts at making jokes to lighten my mood fell flat. Faint cries for help jolted me back to reality, followed by gunshots in rapid succession. Panicking, I rushed to the door and saw Sheriff Hollard with his gun aimed into the increasingly dark woods. His face looked grim when he yelled at me to get back inside. Trembling with fear, I hesitated at the door of my cabin. Moonlight filtered through trees casting sinister shadows around me as a low guttural growl echoed through the woods chilling me further. The sound was predatory like someone or something watching us. That was the moment when a monstrous figure materialized beside the sheriff making me scream in terror. It had elongated limbs and an eerie otherworldly look, unlike any creature I had seen before in my life or nightmare. Run! Sheriff Hollard yelled just before a violent encounter began between him and this unearthly beast that was beyond comprehension. Shots rang out while wood splinters flew through the air amidst anguished screams and gut-wrenching sounds of breaking bones. I backed away from the door and slammed it shut. My heart pounded in my chest as I frantically searched for a place to hide. I couldn't call for help since my phone had no reception, and I doubted anyone could reach me before the creature got to me. I decided to barricade myself behind a heavy oak desk pushed against the cabin wall. It was the only cover I could find on such short notice. In the meantime, Sheriff Hollard continued his struggle outside, but soon the noise stopped. Moments later, pounding at the door jolted me again. With determination in his voice, Sheriff Hollard shouted, You need to leave now. Get in your car and go as fast as you can. I've managed to slow it down, but it won't be long before it's after us. Not wasting a second... I followed his instructions and sprinted toward my vehicle parked a few yards away. 
The sheriff did the same, and we both floored our engines, trying to put as much distance between us and whatever that horrific thing was. As we raced down the dirt road in our separate vehicles at breakneck speed, I heard a screech and saw something leap onto Sheriff Hollard's patrol car. The creature tore open his roof with its enormous claws as if it were made of paper. I didn't have time to mourn Sheriff Hollard or to consider what attacking monster was capable of such brutality only that it wouldn't be long before it turned its attention on me. Nearing the Henderson farm, I spotted Marcus's patrol car parked by the road with flashing lights. Upon seeing my headlights approach rapidly, Marcus stepped out onto the road waving his arms frantically. Get in! I yelled at him as he scrambled into my passenger seat. Marcus didn't ask any questions. Terror painted across his face indicated he had seen enough too. As we drove away, I glanced in the rearview mirror and saw the creature bounding after us, starring with its burning eyes. I drove faster, navigating the curves of the rural roads as if our immense fear fueled my car. Luckily, the creature was unable to keep up with our speeding car. Just when it seemed like we'd escaped for good, we heard a distant howl echoing through the night. We didn't stop until we reached town where we took refuge at the police station. After relaying our harrowing ordeal to the fellow officers, it was clear they were unable to provide an explanation for what had happened. The whole town was stunned and frightened by the events. As word spread, many mourned Sheriff Hollard's untimely death and remembered him as a fearless protector. A few days later, a search and rescue team went back to the cabin but found no traces of the creature or any explanation for its existence. All they discovered was Sheriff Hollard's mangled patrol car by the side of the road. They only knew one thing, whatever that creature was, it was still out there. In time, life smoothly returned to normal as if nothing had ever happened. People cautiously resumed their routines but couldn't help glancing in fear at even the slightest rustling in the woods. As for me, Haunted by that monstrous figure lurking in the shadows of my mind, I struggled through restless nights. I couldn't say whether fear or survival instinct kept me awake, but one certainty lingered. Against all reason and musings this unimaginable reality stole away not only my peace but shook the small town's core forever. My old college buddy, Roger, and I decided to try something new, a little weekend retreat in the Paladin cabin situated deep in the wilderness of Rhode Island. The inviting solitude and serene surroundings felt like an elixir for our overworked souls. We took our time packing up our gear and supplies before leaving on Friday afternoon, completely unaware of the twisted events that awaited us. As we made our way to the cabin, Roger shared stories of past nightmares lurking in his family's history going back generations. These macabre tales of mysterious disappearances, bizarre deaths, and frightening encounters with the unknown sent waves of uneasiness through me. On our first day at the cabin, we busied ourselves with setting up camp, arranging sleeping quarters, laying out firewood, and organizing our provisions. As evening fell, we sat around the fire, roasting marshmallows, sharing light banter, and recalling memories from our college days. We retired to our respective beds after a long day. However, something was bothering me. Through the night, a faint sound lingered in my ears like footsteps rustling through dead leaves. At first light, I shared my concerns with Roger who dismissed them as paranoia brought on by his tales from the previous night. The next day proceeded uneventfully or so we thought until we found peculiar scratch marks on one side of the cabin. What at first appeared to be branches scraping against what started to look like claw marks instead. 
worn leather straps hung lankly near the marks that could only have been left behind by some creature, but no known bears lived nearby. That evening we took turns keeping watch. As I stared into the darkness, an odd figure emerged from behind a tree some distance away from the cabin. Its eyes gleamed menacingly under moonlight, while it skulked close to the ground on all fours before disappearing into the underbrush. Before I could react, a cacophony of screams erupted from within the cabin. Bodies of some unfortunate passers-by lay strewn around in a grotesque display of shredded flesh, their lifeless faces twisted in eternal agony. Even after calling out for help using our satellite radio, the nightmare unfold before our eyes. The feral beast had crossed all boundaries that we thought separated humans from animals. I stood there, my breath caught in my throat as I heard its guttural snarls growing louder and closer. Suddenly, shockingly, it burst forth from the undergrowth charging towards the cabin with incredible speed and rage unlike anything I had ever witnessed. As the creature charged towards the cabin, I instinctively knew that fighting was not an option. Neither I nor my companions could possibly match its ferocity and strength. All we could hope for was escape or the arrival of help. Run! I shouted, desperately hoping my friends made it out alive. We scrambled in different directions, hoping to confuse the beast and by ourselves some time. As we did, Roger managed to call for help on our satellite radio. Help, if any, would take some time to arrive, and we needed to survive until then. The creature seemed hell-bent on attacking us for reasons unknown, and all we could do was run and try not to end up like its previous victims. It had a muscular body, covered in matted fur, and its eyes glowed with an eerie mix of intelligence and complete madness. What resembled a twisted mockery of humanity seemed bent on our destruction. As we ran, gasping for breath, the creature lunged at one of our group, Sarah, seizing her with its massive claws and biting deeply into her shoulder. Her blood-curdling scream pierced the air as she struggled futilely against the creature's relentless assault. There was nothing we could do for her. Any attempt to save her would only mean certain death for us as well. We had called for help and had no choice but to continue running till it arrived or persevered long enough that the creature moved or stopped its pursuit. We regrouped in a clearing, momentarily evading our predator. Our hearts were pounding, and our lungs burned from exertion and fear. No one spoke. There were no words that could convey or justify what was happening to us. A low growl indicated that our antagonist had found us again. My companions immediately scattered, some climbing trees while others continued their flight through the woods. Though I hesitated briefly in deciding which course to take, my instincts ultimately led me to follow suit by seeking refuge up a sturdy pine tree. High atop the branches, I clutched tightly as the creature prowled below, sniffing the air and searching for its prey. Unfortunately for Roger, the beast caught his scent in the underbrush and pounced on him. The sickening crunch of bones and his agonized scream will forever haunt my memories. The creature continued prowling through the woods in search of more victims. As minutes turned into hours, we each prayed silently to evade this inexplicable terror knowing that help was still miles away. Dawn began to break as distant sirens pierced the eerie silence around us. Relief washed over me when I saw flashing lights in the distance. Help had finally arrived. I caught glimpses of my friends being escorted out of the forest by uniformed officers brandishing firearms. As we were led through the woods, we passed by tattered and gruesome reminders of the night's horrors, Sarah's lifeless body abandoned at her demise and Roger's mutilated remains, evidence of a hunter far deadlier than any human we could ever encounter. 
Tears welled up in our eyes as thoughts of our brave friends filled our hearts. The creature never reappeared during our trek back to civilization, but I felt its insidious presence lurking nearby. Questions buzzed around my mind. What was it? Why did it attack us? Would it strike again? But deep down, I knew those questions would remain unanswered. In the end, all that remained was to move forward and cherish the memory of those we lost, to value life more than ever before and face each day with renewed gratitude. As for our harrowing encounter with this deadly unknown animal, it was now firmly locked away in history, a chilling reminder that sometimes it's best to leave certain mysteries unsolved. My name is Andrew Newkirk, and until recently, I'd been living all by myself in a cabin located deep in the woods of Montana. The isolation was a perfect haven for me so I could work on my novel while enjoying the peace and quiet that only Mother Nature could provide. However, the serene background quickly turned horrific, and that unusual tranquility soon consumed my every thought in terror. It started with a trip into town to pick up supplies and essentials when I stumbled upon a grisly crime scene. The local sheriff's vehicle was parked haphazardly outside a diner. It looked like it had been ripped apart by some massive force, its parts scattered across the parking lot, blood staining every surface. The diner's patrons, or what remained of them, lay scattered in grisly pieces barely recognizable as human beings anymore. Fear crawled through my veins like ice water as I took in the grisly scene before me. I dialed 911 from my cell phone, trying hard to suppress the rising panic that threatened to choke me. My trembling hands made it nearly impossible to keep a grip on the phone as I waited for the operator to connect. 911, what's your emergency? The operator answered. Hi, ah, there's, there's been an attack at Montana Joe's diner, I stammered. We're aware of the situation and officers are en route. Please stay where you are until they arrive. The line went dead before I could say anything else. With sweat pouring down my brow, I swallowed hard as dread gnawed at my insides like some relentless beast intent on eating me alive. As minutes ticked by agonizingly slow, strange murmurs rippled through the small gathering crowd word of some terrible monster responsible for this carnage. Though these claims seemed absurd, something deep within me resonated with this unsettling theory. Soon after law enforcement arrived and assessed the situation, the atmosphere around town changed. Firearms sold out within hours, and families barricaded their homes as the community braced for some unspeakable terror to descend upon them. Despite the growing fear in town, I forced myself to return to my cabin in the woods. My only hope was that whatever lurked beyond the confines of civilization wouldn't find me out there. Days faded into each other as I struggled to regain a sense of normalcy in my life. Eventually, that eerie calm returned, but it did nothing to dissipate the lingering dread. The once serene forest now felt suffocating. One evening, just as dusk began to descend over my little corner of Montana, I decided to take a walk along a nearby creek in hopes of erasing some of the day's tension from my weary body. The water burbled happily beside me, offering solace for a mind still haunted by that gruesome diner scene. I paused near an old oak tree where a deer had been feasting on its leaves, what was left of it, at least. The carcass was dismembered and strewn about haphazardly, much like the bodies at the diner. My heart skipped a beat as icy fear gripped my chest. That monstrous force had been here too. The sound of snapping branches echoed throughout the forest followed by an ear-piercing screech that shook me down to my bones. My heart pounded rapidly, 
threatening to escape its fleshy prison as an indescribable creature approached me, its gnarled limbs untangled from the underbrush. Razor-sharp claws gleamed menacingly in what remaining sunlight still penetrated these dense woods. As I fearfully beheld this grotesque figure towering over me with malice-tinged eyes narrowed dangerously towards their prey, me, I dared not move or even breathe. In this terrifying moment suspended between life and death, the only thing I could feel was regret for turning against my instincts and returning to that accursed cabin. The creature snarled and lunged at me, teeth bared and ready to tear apart every fiber of my being. Panic raced through me, but my legs wouldn't move. I was frozen in fear, unable to do anything. In a stroke of luck or sheer coincidence, another animal, a bear, charged into the area, likely attracted by the sound of the commotion. The creature turned its attention from me to the bear, and it was evident that neither stood a chance against the other. I seized this brief distraction as my opportunity to escape. I sprinted through the thick woods faster than I had ever run in my life. Branches clawed at my face and arms, pain spreading from each scratch. But there was no time to think about the injuries. I needed to get away from that grotesque beast. The further I ran, the more I questioned how futile it would be to call for help. Even if someone heard me or found me, what could they possibly do against such a monstrous abomination? This wasn't a mere predator. It bore something unknown and malevolent that set it apart from any other creature I have witnessed before. As I continued running desperately through the woods with ragged breaths tearing at my throat, eventually reaching a small clearing right before a rickety bridge stretched across a ravine. My body hesitated for just a second before daring to cross it with desperation fueled by terror. Just as I reached the other side of the ravine, I felt something snap behind me. The world lurched beneath me as the weight of this monstrous creature came crashing down upon my improvised escape route. Time seemed to slow down as we both fell into the ravine below, me on one side tangled in ropes and splintered wood, the grotesque creature on the other end writhing in agony on impact. A primal instinct washed over me, our fates were now intertwined, and I had to think quickly if I ever wanted a chance at survival. As the creature began to regain its footing, I struggled to climb up my side of the ravine, with each inch I gained, an indescribable fear pushed me forward, aware of how much more agile and lethal the other creature was compared to me. Not daring to look down at that horrific visage below, I eventually clambered to the top of the ravine. My hands shook uncontrollably as I gripped soil and foliage tightly, pulling myself up and over the edge. The creature let loose a roar of rage from the depths of its grotesque chest, echoing through widened gaps within its broken form. It seemed almost like a cruel taunt that the bear, which had unwittingly saved me earlier, was now gone. In the distance, the sound of wild dogs yelping and barking in terror indicated that some kind of twisted hierarchy had been recognized among them. I ran once more thinking about those dismembered bodies from before. It might not have all happened for nothing if someone else out there could learn from the experiences I'd suffered through. That hope spurred me on as my exhausted legs carried me toward what little safety civilization offered. Days later, after navigating through dense underbrush and following the faintest paths left behind by familiar wildlife marking familiar territory, I stumbled back into town, a shell-shocked stranger who had returned from the dead. People stared at my haggard appearance then as news spread. Stories whispered in hushed voices took on their own weight with each whispered retelling. But no matter how many times others may try to soften it or embellish it for dramatic effect, the truth will remain unchanged. I saw something terrible lurking out there in nature an unstoppable force stalking anyone unlucky enough to cross its path. 
I cannot unsee it, and perhaps it's for the best that I cannot forget it either. As the town mourned the loss of the lives taken away by this unknown terror, I often found myself glancing back toward those woods encroaching upon our quiet community. In that green abyss lay a reformed darkness waiting in hunger for the day when fear would once again escape my lips and call forth that mangled, grotesque creature from my nightmares into our reality. It all started when I received a frantic phone call from my longtime friend, Lindsay Havers. She called me in a panic, babbling about a grotesque sight she had stumbled upon during her hike in Pine Valley Forest. The real-life location or names weren't as important to me as the thrill of a spontaneous trip to somewhere unknown. My curiosity was piqued, and I knew we had to go see it for ourselves. Despite her hesitance, I convinced Lindsay and our other friend, Reggie Tremont, to accompany me. Packing our bags quickly, we set off for the cabin where this horror apparently awaited us. We arrived at the tucked-away cabin just before sunset. It was a modest structure made of timber, with no neighbors or civilization nearby, isolation we never could have fathomed. Inside, we dragged ourselves through the chores and preparations necessary for our stay. Before long, exhaustion took over. We scrambled into bed with anticipation lacing our dreams. The following morning, fortified by coffee and breakfast, we decided to venture out into the woods and find whatever it was that struck poor Lindsay with terror. We trekked through dense foliage and over uneven terrain determination pulsing through our veins. As we approached the area Lindsay had described to us in disturbing detail, my instincts warned me that something seemed off. Birds ceased singing and even the rustling of leaves became silent. Lindsay's face was drained of color as she pointed ahead at what looked like massive scratch marks etched into a tree trunk. See that? Lindsay whispered tremulously. That's where I found that thing. Reggie leaned down matter-of-factly examining the marks closer while chuckling nervously. Maybe it was just an overly aggressive squirrel. His attempt to lighten the mood stifled quickly. As if on cue, a rank smell wafted through the air causing us all to gag involuntarily. I knew no squirrel could make that scent, nor were those marks from any animal I had ever seen. The grotesque stench grew even stronger, and we could no longer deny our surroundings as the eerie realization set in something unearthly lurked nearby. The shrill cries of a woman in distress broke our paralyzed state. We sprang into action, bolting towards the sound of the cries. Our hearts pounded, and our limbs moved faster than they'd ever moved before. Turning a bend in the path, we stumbled upon an indescribable scene. A hulking creature stood over a mutilated body, blood and viscera heaped around it like a grotesque banquet. The monstrous being had long, razor-sharp claws that glistened in the sunlight as it slashed at its prey with brutal force. The sight was like the most twisted horror spectacle sprung to life, gore, fear, and dread poisoning our minds all at once. My initial response was disbelief. Surely this was an optical illusion or some other trick of the mind. As our eyes locked with those of the creatures, cold and devoid of anything human, I knew this wasn't an illusion. Those sunken eyes belonged to a living nightmare. The beast snarled at us before charging straight at Reggie. Panic washed over us as we focused on survival alone. We stumbled back in a frenzy. Reggie hollered for help. Guys, hand me that damn gun! In my shock-stricken state, I groped for the weapon we had brought for safety. My shaking hands fumbled with it as I tried to pass it off to Reggie while the monstrosity closed in on him with bloodthirsty rage. 
I managed to pass the gun to Reggie just in time. He took aim with trembling hands and fired. The bullet struck the creature in its shoulder, barely slowing it down. The realization that our only weapon was powerless sent a wave of dread through all of us. Run! Call 911! Reggie shouted. We scattered in different directions, hoping to confuse the beast and buy ourselves enough time to call for help. I ran, gripping my phone tightly and dialing as I dashed through the woods. The operator's voice rang in my ear, but I could barely form words through my gasps. Something's attacking us. Creature, need help. The creature's snarls echoed behind me. It was catching up. I looked over my shoulder to see it gaining on me, its muscular limbs propelling it forward with terrifying speed. In a desperate attempt to escape, I climbed the nearest tree, an absurd idea, but it was the only one that came to mind as panic clouded my thoughts. The beast reached the tree, clawing at its base before looking up at me with those soulless eyes. It leaped snapping branches in its attempt to ascend my safe haven. It didn't reach me but dropped back down and paced around the tree in frustration. As I clung onto the branch, shivering in fear, blood-curdling screams from my friends filled the air. One by one, they fell prey to this nightmare creature. Back on the phone with a terrified police operator, all I could do was sob and pray for someone to rescue us from this terror. Please hurry. Then suddenly, something remarkable happened. Sirens wailed from a distance, piercing the chaotic symphony with a promise of salvation. The creature stopped dead in its tracks. It seemed wary of the approaching noise. In what felt like an eternity compressed into seconds, police cars arrived at our location, lights blazing and officers pouring out of the vehicles, guns drawn and ready to fire. Upon seeing the armed defenders, the animalistic creature snarled menacingly, but to our disbelief, it actually retreated. Slowly at first, but as more officers arrived on the scene, it bolted away from us and disappeared into the woods. That day marked a shift in our reality, an intrusion into our once normal lives. My friends, Reggie, Tiffany, and Michelle, were taken from me by a creature that defied comprehension. Its rampage was brutal and relentless. I was left with scars from witnessing such a gruesome event. We never saw that monstrous predator again. The town was on high alert for weeks, my every waking moment haunted by those who were lost. I wondered if this harrowing encounter would ever fade from memory. Unable to bear staying in a place where tragedy struck so fiercely, I moved away to start a new life far from the woods where something otherworldly had ripped away our mundane existence. In times of solitary reflection or upon hearing distant sirens wail, I honor the memory of my friends, brave souls whose lives were claimed in that nightmarish ordeal. My heart takes with the thought of their suffering but I am grateful for the time we spent together in life before their graceless departure from this world. I remain ever vigilant, aware of the lurking nightmares that exist just at the edge of humanity's comprehension. For in this unpredictable realm we call existence, sometimes all it takes is one horrifying encounter to shake our fragile foundation, leaving us questioning what lies hidden within the shadows of our darkest fears. My lifelong friend, Timothy Johnson, and I had taken an overdue vacation up to a cabin near Crescent Lake in Oregon. Tim hadn't been feeling well for quite some time, and this retreat seemed like the perfect remedy. We planned to fish the lake and hike the surrounding trails, finally ending the summer months on a high note. Tim's sister Sarah had lent us her cabin for the duration of the trip. It was far too remote for her tastes, but we loved the solitude. 
On our third night there, I sprung awake. Something had slammed into the side of the cabin with tremendous force and sent me tumbling out of bed. Tim roused from his sleep, rubbing his eyes. Caleb, what the hell just happened? I don't know, I replied, still disoriented from being jolted awake. Did you feel that? Something hit the cabin. We cautiously stepped outside only to find our fishing boat overturned and significantly damaged at the shore. Trees surrounding it were splintered and splattered with blood. What could have done this? Tim asked nervously as we stared in disbelief. Our plan for a peaceful retreat had taken a sudden turn. I have no idea, maybe a bear? But how could it throw our boat like that? I wondered aloud. Gulping down my fear, I tried to keep Tim's spirits up by cracking a tasteless joke. Don't worry, bears can't open doors, or so they say. He scoffed at my attempt at humor but appreciated my effort. Over dinner later that night, we decided it would be best to give our trip an early end and leave in the morning. The creature, whatever it was, was too unsettling to ignore. We couldn't shake our unease at having found blood near our wrecked boat. The next morning, preparing to leave began with frantic haste. The thought of encountering that animal was always at the forefront of our minds. In the midst of packing our things, I froze. The room's temperature seemed to drop, and a peculiar stench entered the air. A stench unlike anything I had ever experienced a mix of rotting flesh, bile, and something else. Something far worse. Suddenly, we heard the screen door creak open, followed by scraping sounds along the wooden floor. Tim and I locked eyes and remained as still as possible. If this was the creature, we couldn't give it any indication that we were inside. The scraping continued up to the doorway. Every muscle in my body tensed as I braced myself for whatever stood on the other side. Peeking from behind my shirt collar, I finally saw it, a monstrous figure that couldn't be made up or fathomed. It resembled a horribly twisted amalgamation of man and beast, with several disjointed limbs jutting out from its oversized torso. Its face was contorted into an ungodly arrangement of teeth and jagged bone. It continued clawing its way into the cabin, unlike anything I had ever seen in reality or the most grotesque nightmare imaginable. Every step revealed muscles rippling beneath its disturbingly adapted skin. Tim screamed upon seeing the abomination. His outburst gave me no choice but to make a run for it outside as quickly as humanly possible. I dashed for cover before realizing Tim hadn't followed suit, annihilating any hope of rescue or protection with one swift motion. It crushed my phone with its cruel hands before turning back to chase me relentlessly through the trees. My breathless sprint, fueled by pure adrenaline and fear for my life, yielded no escape from the eerie silence interrupted occasionally by movement nearby clear indications that the creature was still closely stalking our every move. Frantically dodging branches while running at full speed, we scrambled downwards into what could only be described as a living nightmare, one which put every fiber of our beings into the utmost alarm. The monstrous being pursued us with relentless determination, its distorted form hiding in and out of the shadows as if toying with us before administering a brutal, horrendous fate. With memories of the earlier gore etched indelibly in our minds, either Tim nor I could bear the thought of what would have happened had we been caught face to face with that thing again. The chase seemed to go on forever, the fear never subsiding as we tried our best to evade the monstrous creature. Despite our efforts, it never felt like we gained any distance between us and the beast. In a stroke of luck, we stumbled upon a cave. With no other options in sight, Tim and I entered hurriedly, hoping to find some reprieve from our relentless pursuer. 
We could tell that it had caught on to our scent when we heard its enraged roars just outside the cavern entrance. We exchanged quick glances before continuing deeper into the cave, hoping that the darkness would aid in concealing us from its sight. Exhausted, we pressed ourselves against the cold, damp walls and waited with bated breath. The sounds of its heavy breathing and steady footsteps echoed through the cave. We tremored with fear, praying that it wouldn't hear our rapidly pounding hearts. After what seemed like an eternity, the unholy growls and footfalls grew fainter as the creature moved away from our hiding spot. Taking advantage of this rare moment of reprieve, Tim spoke up in hushed tones. What are we going to do? We can't run forever. We need to find other people, maybe a group of hikers or someone who can help. I replied urgently. Any place where people might be able to overpower this thing or at least provide temporary safety. We continued deeper into the cave while remaining as quiet as possible until we reached an exit on its other side. Fortunately, this led us to a trail frequently used by hikers, judging by its well-maintained state. Our exhaustion momentarily forgotten, we stumbled onto the trail and began looking for any signs of human presence but found nothing. As a last-ditch effort for survival, we scanned the area and decided to follow the trail downhill with renewed vigor, hoping that it would lead us back into civilization or at least to a location where we could call for help. On our descent, we encountered another group of hikers who, after seeing the overwhelming fear within us, realized that we were in serious danger. We explained the harrowing situation to them, about the grotesque creature that chased and tortured us both mentally and physically. Unsurprisingly, they found it hard to believe but couldn't deny the terror etched on our faces. One of them, a seasoned hiker named John, offered us the use of his satellite phone. Desperate for help and with no other options in sight, we contacted local authorities to inform them of the lurking terror in the woods. With their help, a helicopter arrived to airlift us to safety as heavily armed personnel flooded the area to hunt down the barbaric beast. As we were being lifted away from our horrific ordeal, I spotted bloodied carcasses strewn across the ground below, signs of the creature's unrelenting carnage. We watched as law enforcement officers and experienced hunters combed through the forest in search of the monstrosity. After several nerve-wracking hours, they emerged victorious, having killed the frightening creature and putting an end to its violent rampage. In its aftermath, we learned that others had perished in similarly horrifying ways. Investigations unearthed gruesome deaths attributed to this savage entity in surrounding forests, deaths that were all too reminiscent of what Tim and I narrowly escaped. With lives lost at its murderous hands, a sense of grief coexisted with relief as we grieved for those who weren't as fortunate as us. The creature's reign of terror had finally been brought to an end. However, Tim and I knew that we would never forget our nightmarish experience among those dark woods. And so life went on, slowly but surely returning to normalcy. The chaos caused by the unspeakable violence had left many brokenhearted, but as time went on, healing began. The forest where we had come face to face with terror became a memorial site for those who lost their lives to the gruesome monster. Their lives would always be remembered, and Tim and I will forever be grateful for our fortunate escape from the claws of such unimaginable evil. My name is Owen Davis, and I've lived in my humble cabin in the heart of the serene Redwood National Forest. California for almost five years. Remote, yes, but it's perfect for when you need to get away from it all. My usual days consist of breakfast at my small wooden table, 
gazing out over those towering trees before tackling some wood chopping or gardening. One afternoon after returning from a long walk through the forest, I cracked a joke to myself about not even needing a gym membership with all this manual labor. I chuckled lightly before deciding to head inside for something to drink. No sooner had I grabbed a glass of water when I heard an unexpected knock at my door. Curious, I opened it to find an old woman struggling to catch her breath. Sensing her distress, I invited her inside and offered her some water. She explained that she had just stumbled across a horrifying sight in the woods the dismembered remains of what she could only assume was a group of hikers. Her hands trembled as she spoke. As disturbing as her revelation was, I struggled to believe it fully. Grizzly killings didn't happen around here. The old woman insisted it was the work of something supernatural, something out of myth or legend. Knowing that dusk was upon us and we'd lose sunlight soon, we decided to head out to investigate together. My skepticism remained strong as we made our way through the dense forest, armed only with large walking sticks and flashlights. As we approached the area she described, harrowing cries echoed around us. A figure rustled at the edge of our flashlight beams an odd shape, inconsistent with any known animal or man. A feeling of dread crept over me as the creature emerged from behind the trees. It was unlike anything I had ever seen, its limbs elongated and lanky like twigs, pale green eyes glowed with malice, its body covered in a matted, dark brown fur, with bits of flesh tangled up within the fibers. Razor-sharp teeth protruded from its disfigured mouth, left agape as it focused its gruesome gaze on us. The old woman screamed. This wasn't just some dangerous beast that was a living nightmare. Inexplicably, the creature moved towards us with an unnerving gait, its elongated limbs flailing and twisting as if held together by mere threads. We stood frozen in terror. As it closed in on us, I finally managed to find my voice and shouted at the creature. Hey, what do you call an all-night sleepover at a mattress store? A slumber party! The creature hesitated for a moment before hissing angrily and picking up speed in our direction. With no other option left, I threw myself and the old woman off the path into a thicket. Praying that our impromptu hiding place held, we lay there silently as we watched the horrifying creature search for us with those sickening eyes. The old woman and I laid in the thicket, trying not to breathe too loudly. The creature shuffled past our hiding spot, but thankfully didn't notice us. After a few agonizing minutes, it let out an infuriated snarl before disappearing further into the forest. Despite my pounding heart, I managed to whisper, we need to call for help. The old woman nodded her agreement, her eyes wide with terror. I pulled out my phone, praying for even a single bar of reception. Luck seemed to be on our side as a weak signal appeared. I quickly dialed 911 and explained the situation to the operator a bizarre creature attacked us in the forest, and it might still be near. Stay where you are. The operator instructed. We're sending help immediately. And so we waited, hidden in our makeshift sanctuary among the brush. Every rustle in the bushes made us jump in fear that the dreadful creature had returned. Half an hour later, we heard a distant voice calling our names. I peeked through the foliage and saw a small search team approaching cautiously, armed with rifles. Over here! I called out to them. Relief washed over me as they reached our hiding spot and helped the old woman and me to our feet. What happened here? One of them asked urgently as he glanced around nervously. I hesitated at first but decided to recount everything from the odd figure behind trees to its ungodly features like its elongated limbs wrapped in matted fur. They listened attentively with furrowed brows. 
Without wasting any time, we began making our way back towards civilization, guided by flashlights and escorted by armed search party members. Along the way, some inquired whether we were hurt or not. Luckily, either of us was injured at least not physically. As we moved through the dense woods, tension gripped us all with an iron fist, fearing the creature might attack again. Escorting us onwards, some in the search team spoke nervously amongst themselves, questioning whether they'd ever seen such a thing in their years of working in wilderness rescue. Eventually, we arrived back at our starting point our small town's outskirts. I thanked the officers profusely and exchanged contact information with the old woman united by our harrowing experience. The days following the incident turned into a mix of dread and disbelief local newspapers and tabloids fueled by reporters questioning whether an unidentified animal or human was responsible for recent attacks. Police conducted an extensive search for the creature but found no trace of it anywhere. Rumors began to circulate was this just an unknown breed of animal, a deranged individual in disguise, or something else entirely? As much as I wanted answers to what happened that night in the forest, I couldn't ignore the nagging sensation in my head telling me that some mysteries are better left unsolved. In time, life went back to normal for most people, but for me and the old woman, there would always be lingering questions and memories of a sickening nightmare clothed with grotesque fur. The days turned into weeks, then months passed by. The town grew quieter than ever as people avoided spending too much time outside after dusk another lingering effect of our strange encounter on that fateful night in the forest. The creature was never found nor identified leaving behind only a chilling reminder that there was something sinister lurking among us buried deep within those woods. I've never been one for superstitions. I prefer evidence and logic. Having relocated recently to a cabin in the woods in the rural outskirts of Maine, I was seeking an escape from the fast-paced, crazy city life. Folks around here go by names like Wyatt Rambler and Bluey Paxton, not the kind of company I ever imagined keeping. My name is Bronco Flynn, and I didn't know it at the time, but my quest for solitude would lead me into a horror far beyond my worst nightmares. My mundane existence of chopping wood and guiding tourists on nature hikes took an unexpected turn one morning. As I was setting up some bird feeders near my cabin, I discovered strange tracks in the mud. They resembled a large bird's claws mixed with something like human fingers. I tried to rationalize what could have caused such marks but found no plausible explanation. A few days later, during an outing with a small group of visitors, a mother and daughter duo named Zaley and Myrna Call Garlandberg, we stumbled upon the carcass of a freshly killed deer. The sight was gruesome. Something had brutally torn away at its flesh, leaving it barely recognizable. Confused and disgusted, I guided our group back to safety while conjuring up explanations for what or who might have done this. That evening, during supper with Zaley and Myrna at their rented cabin near mine, we exchanged theories around the table. Trying to lighten the mood, Zaley joked that maybe our mysterious killer was trying to ruin her diet by interrupting her taste for venison. We all laughed nervously but couldn't shake the nagging feeling that something sinister was stalking these woods. In an attempt to put speculation to rest, Myrna contacted her cousin Soren Cumberbirch, who served in a police search team. They agreed to visit us the next day, but deep inside, we were all dreading the sun going down. After a sleepless night, I went to collect firewood from the back of my cabin. The air felt thick, heavy with dread as I hauled the logs over my shoulder. And then... There it was sounds of heavy breathing and low growl coming from the underbrush. 
My body went into autopilot as I dropped the wood and sprinted towards the main entrance. Soren arrived at dawn with his fellow officer Arlene Salmonhill. They'd brought equipment to help secure the area while we tried to figure out what was terrorizing us. Zaley, Myrna, and I spent the day offering suggestions of what could be causing these events, speculating about hunter traps or a pack of wolves or bears roaming nearby. But deep inside, we knew nothing ordinary could produce such abhorrent evidence like we'd seen. Late that night, after setting up surveillance cameras around my property and pointing flashlights in every direction possible, Soren gathered us around his laptop revealing some horrifying images that chilled us to our core. The creature wasn't anything like an animal it had elongated limbs ending in both human-like fingers and bird's claws. Its entire body covered in patches of scales and feathers. Reptilian eyes glowing menacingly in the dark. Rows of sharp teeth in its twisted mouth. The realization that this thing this monster was lurking so close rendered us speechless. We locked our doors and windows, but hopelessness suffocated us like a fog as it approached midnight. Several hours later, as fear consumed me and my heart raced, there came a knock at my door. Arlene stood there panting, face pale with urgency. Bronco! It got Soren! Before I could even register those words fully, another knock came from the window behind me. Instantly overwhelmed by a gut-wrenching panic, I gripped the doorknob and ordered Zaley and Myrna to barricade themselves inside their cabin. We stepped outside, prepared to confront this living nightmare. The monster towered above us, its gaze radiating pure evil. Arlene fired at it with his service weapon while I aimed my trusty shotgun, each of us desiring nothing but survival. Arlene and I continued firing at the monstrous creature, desperate to fend off its unfaltering assault. It shrieked in pain before lashing out with one of its clawed limbs, catching Arlene across his chest and sending him crashing into a nearby tree. My determination surged as I shouted for Zaley and Myrna to run for their lives while I attempted to hold off the nightmarish being. Through a mix of fear and rage, I emptied my shotgun, pumping round after round into the creature. It finally staggered, seemingly injured but far from defeated. The creature turned its attention back to me, its glowing eyes narrowing as it prepared for another attack. Fumbling with shaking hands, I tried to reload my shotgun in haste. Zaley's voice pierced through the night air. Bronco! Over here! She waved frantically from her truck, engine revving. Reluctant but seeing no other option, I sprinted after Zaley, scrambling into the truck's cab. With Zaley behind the wheel and Myrna clinging onto the passenger seat, we sped away from our property and the unnatural beast. Screaming my lungs out, trying to catch my breath after reaching a safer distance from that abominable creature that had as terrifying aspect as if it had escaped from deepest and darkest nightmares. We then decided to go directly to the nearest police station. We could not afford wasting any time or risk letting it escape without anyone knowing what we were up against. Upon arrival at the station, we quickly explained our situation to Officer Jenkins who despite initial lack of belief agreed to help us since Arlene was involved. Accompanied by two other officers armed with powerful rifles, our group returned to my house. We found Arlene unconscious beneath the tree where he had been flung earlier but miraculously alive and breathing. The officers tended to him while we searched the area for any sign of the creature. The daylight was now fading fast, and our sense of unease grew exponentially within the dim atmosphere. When the sun finally disappeared beyond the horizon, we heard it, the guttural growl of that monstrous entity coming from the woods. We instantly alerted the officers, who formed a tight circle around us and aimed their firearms towards the unsettling sound. 
At that moment, we decided to call for backup and to let everyone in our town know about this imminent threat lurking around. The creature emerged from the darkness, its bloodlust overpowering any lingering pain from earlier. With a mighty roar, it charged straight at us with supernatural speed. The officer's hail of gunfire barely seemed to slow it down. In an instant, one of them was plucked from his feet and tossed aside like a ragdoll, his body twisting into an unnatural position. The remaining officer, Jenkins, managed to land a critical shot in one of the creature's eyes. It howled with rage and agony, rearing back before disappearing once again into the shadows. With no other option but to wait for reinforcements, we retreated to my house to regroup. Additional police units arrived as news spread throughout our town. The following days saw multiple search parties organized, combing every inch of the surrounding landscape in search of that terrifying monster. But it was clear that somehow it had disappeared as quickly as it had arrived. The town grieved the loss of Soren and sympathized with Arlene's injuries. As events unfolded, fear also began to ferment among them all about what kind of creature could elude human intervention so easily. I sincerely hope never see that monster again or not have anyone else suffering its deadly attacks. But if that happens or there is an opportunity to prevent further harm, I won't hesitate to confront it once more. We must find a way to protect ourselves against this abhorred creature an animalistic monster whose intentions are not only driven by instinct but also by malicious and cunning will. The events of these past few days have made one thing abundantly clear. We are no longer safe in our own homes. My name is Tyrone Hadley and I just moved into this cabin in the woods about six weeks ago. I have had quite a roller coaster of a ride getting here. It's hard to believe that what started as trying to make a quirky joke at the local diner led to such a bizarre series of events. One afternoon, as I complained about my recently uprooted life, a woman named Janice Winter let me in on a little secret. Apparently, there was an urban legend among the locals involving an elusive and monstrous creature deep in these woods. The thing was, she couldn't help but chuckle while she told the story, which led me to believe this mysterious creature was nothing more than bored townspeople's tall tale. After striking up an uneasy friendship with Janice, along with another wanderer named Enrique Vaz, we decided to take nightly walks near the cabin and explore the dense woods that seemed so full of rumors and menace. On one fateful night, we stumbled upon an eerie scene, an abandoned campsite littered with torn clothing and belongings scattered haphazardly on the ground. Instinctively, I reached for my gun tucked in my waistband. Poor Enrique could barely keep from retching at the awful smell surrounding the area. Trying to stifle nervous laughter, Janice urged us to continue exploring for any sign of fellow victims or nefarious lurkers so we could report back to the local sheriff. Little did we know that soon after we continued our search, we'd come face to face with complete and utter terror. Approaching twisty undergrowth surrounded by thorny vines where trees were deeply scored with long scratch marks as if attacked by enormous claws, Strange clicking sounds permeated through suffocating silence. As if appearing out of nowhere, a grotesque figure stood before us with scaly skin glinting menacingly under faint moonlight. The creature towered well over seven feet tall and had sinister, snake-like eyes that stared straight into our souls. It opened its immense wings, flexing grotesque, hook-like talons at the end of each joint of its limbs. Panic surged through my veins, and my survival instincts kicked in. Janice screamed hysterically while Enrique froze in sheer terror as the creature pounced upon him with nightmarish speed. 
My hands shook uncontrollably as I struggled to regain control over my firearm. It's a strange sensation to know that every movement you make affects not only your life but also the lives of your companions. In a split second of half-fear-filled bravado and half-desperation, I fired one shot after another and kept firing until the piercing howls of the vile beast creature echoed through the dense woods. But before I could reload and continue the attack or run towards where Enrique lay in agony, tendrils of darkness swarmed from all around us, swallowing everything in their path like a fever dream turning into reality, leaving only bitter cold despair to fill our minds. I stood there, my gun still smoking after unloading all its rounds on the monstrous creature. Janice's screaming had stopped and the only sound was the agonizing whimpers of Enrique who lay crumpled against the tree. I wanted to call for help, but my mind was racing, and I struggled to figure out what I could possibly say that would make any sense to anyone. Fear had shattered any hopes of rational thought, making asking for help difficult. Still, knowingly needed assistance, I pulled out my phone and dialed the local sheriff's office. Holding the phone to my ear, feeling more terror as each ring echoed in my ears, until finally someone picked up. Hello? Sheriff's Department. A gruff voice answered. There's been something happened. We need help. I stammered, struggling to find the words to describe our ordeal. The creature had twisted Enrique in unimaginable ways, leaving him barely recognizable. Every limb seemed broken or dislocated. Janice was standing near me as I spoke with the sheriff's department, her face pale from witnessing the attack. I don't know exactly what it was, but it, it attacked us. I continued describing the situation. Please hurry. I gave them our approximate location in the woods and hung up the call, hoping they would find us soon. We didn't dare approach Enrique just yet. As the tendrils of darkness faded away after swallowing the wounded creature, we were too afraid it might still be lurking nearby. Suddenly we heard sirens in the distance, firefighters, police cars, and an ambulance converging on our location. Their lights pierced through the trees as they got closer. Relief washed over Janice and me as we finally felt that there may be hope for survival. As rescuers arrived on scene, they tended to Enrique first, his condition critical from his injuries inflicted by the malicious beast. The emergency responders cautiously approached him, eyes scanning the area for any sign of the creature. While they tended to Enrique, another group of deputies questioned Janice and me trying to understand what we had encountered. We described the creature as best we could, its towering height, scaly skin, snake-like eyes, and those horrendous wings lined with hook-like talons. The rescuers helped us through the woods back towards civilization. Each step away from that horrifying scene brought a small glimmer of hope for our survival. Finally reaching safety, we knew there would be a long road ahead as authorities sought to uncover the truth about the creature that had attacked us. In the following days, search parties returned to that original campsite. They found the torn clothing and scattered belongings, but no trace of the creature itself. It seemed to have disappeared entirely, leaving only destruction and questions behind. We learned later that Enrique succumbed to his injuries in the hospital shortly after being rescued from that dreadful scene, another victim in a twisted event we never wanted any part of. Janice and I struggled with our grief, mourning the loss of a friend while simultaneously grappling with our close encounter with death's doorstep. News reports echoed our story while people in town spoke in hushed whispers about what they thought might have happened out there in those dark woods. Researchers and animal experts proposed theories on what kind of creature could be responsible for such carnage, but nothing explained it entirely. As days turned into weeks, 
people soon began to forget about what happened in those woods. However, Janice and I will forever remember that harrowing experience and constantly hope it never crosses our path again. In our mind's eye remains etched memories of our dear friend Enrique, taken too soon by a hellish terror none could fully understand. And so, we can only look forward with determination and vigilance, always cautious about what might come to pass in the darkest corners of the world. My name is Crispin McBain and for the past year, I've been living in a secluded cabin deep in the woods of northern Wisconsin, the Arrowhead Peninsula. It was supposed to be a quiet and peaceful retreat, a necessary escape from the stresses of city life. I decided to come here after the unexpected death of my fiance, Anya. She had always loved nature, so this place seemed like an appropriate way to stay connected with her memory. The cabin was situated near the shore of Lake Superior, tucked away between rows of towering red pines and white birches. Though it was isolated, I needed that detachment from society in order to grieve properly. However, not long after settling into my new life, things took an unnerving turn. One morning before daybreak, I discovered unidentifiable remnants of what must have been at least four creatures both wild game and trespassers. The bodies had been mangled beyond recognition, ripped apart by what looked like savage claws or teeth. The local ranger came by to assess the scene after I reported it. Frowning, he informed me that he had never seen anything like it before. With no leads or clues, we were forced to chalk it up to some unknown predator roaming through the wilderness. Days stretched into weeks without incident as I continued with my routine around the cabin. In my free time, I'd often hike some of the nearby trails for exercise and solitude. During these hikes, I sometimes thought I heard strange howls echoing from deeper within the woods. Yet no matter how hard I tried to push it out of my mind, those mysterious deaths always came back to haunt me. It wasn't until months later that my fear reached its boiling point. It was late afternoon when my good friend Jackson Miller dropped by unannounced for a visit on his way home from an exhausting month working at a nearby logging camp. With no plans for the evening, we decided to sit on the porch, enjoying the refreshing breeze and catching up with each other's life stories. As night descended upon us, Jackson suddenly tensed up, his eyes darting towards the tree line. I followed his gaze and froze in shock as I witnessed something lumbering out of the shadows. It skulked towards us like some twisted mockery of both man and beast covered in dents, shaggy fur and leathery patches. It had bulbous, dark eyes void of any whites and tall crescent-shaped ears that flicked their focus between us. It reared up on two hind legs so that it towered above us at a staggering seven feet. Its spindly front limbs ended in long, hooked talons caked with decay and filth, a grotesque extension of its deadly intent. A noticeable stench wafted off its chitinous body, a putrid mix of bile-filled stomachs and foul-smelling organic pieces. Jackson raised his hunting rifle and shot twice in rapid succession, hitting the creature in its hunched shoulder area. It winced but did not fall or retreat. Instead, it shrieked like a banshee before lunging towards our location. This maddening cry was unlike anything I'd ever heard. It sounded like tortured metal combined with human-like crying a chilling blend that made my blood run cold. With no time to lose, I charged shoulder first into the creature, knocking it off balance and buying enough time for Jackson and me to sprint back into the house. We locked the door behind us, and I hurried to my phone to call the police. As I explained our situation to the operator, trying to keep my voice steady, 
I could hear the creature's guttural growls outside. Minutes crawled by as we waited for help to arrive. The growling only grew louder, occasionally interrupted by the sound of claws scraping against the walls, as if searching for a way inside. Jackson shouted that we needed weapons, anything to defend ourselves, so we gathered knives from the kitchen and held them tightly in our hands. The creature suddenly burst through the window, its grotesque form filling every inch of space. It lunged at Jackson, its talons sinking into his shoulder. He screamed in pain and fell backward. Acting on instinct, I threw my knife at the creature's head. It pierced one of its bulbous eyes, causing it to howl in agony and release Jackson from its grip. The front door flew open as two police officers entered with their guns drawn. Assessing the situation quickly, they aimed and fired at the enraged beast in our living room. With each gunshot echoing through the house, dark ichor oozed from its wounds. Finally, after what felt like an eternity, it collapsed lifelessly onto the floor. One officer called for backup while the other attended to Jackson's injuries. Paramedics arrived shortly after to evaluate our condition further and take us to a nearby hospital. Over several days of treatment and questioning by authorities, speculation circled about what kind of animal or creature could have attacked us but there were no definitive answers found. All they knew was that it wasn't something anyone had ever encountered before. Jackson recovered from his injuries after a long stay at the hospital. We often visited each other, talking about the terrifying event that had brought us closer together and kept us bonded by a shared memory that words could scarcely describe. When we were well enough to go on hikes once more, we made sure never to venture too deep into those woods again just in case. In the following months, a memorial was erected near our town's center for the six victims who had lost their lives to the mysterious beast. Their names etched into memory and stone, a somber reminder of what once stalked the shadows of our peaceful town. The creature's remains were taken away for examination and study by some unknown organization leaving its origins and motivations forever shrouded in darkness. The attack changed Jackson and me in ways we could never have predicted, but life continued as normally as we could manage. The knowledge that something unexplained lurked in our world was a chilling reality we now had to face every day. However, despite it all, we were grateful for one thing. By some stroke of luck or twisted fate, we had survived. My name is Lennox Mueller, and I had recently moved into a secluded cabin deep in the forest surrounding Spokane, Washington. The idea was to get away from the city, enjoy some fresh air and serenity, and explore the dense woods surrounding my newfound home. As a nature enthusiast, I loved the idea of being immersed in the heart of the great outdoors. One morning I invited my best friend, Titus Finch, to join me on a long hike through the woods. With our backpacks loaded with food supplies and a thermos full of coffee, we embarked upon what we thought would be nothing more than an exhilarating journey through nature's vast beauty. As we hiked deeper into the forest, we marveled at towering trees and encountered several squirrels darting about with incredible agility. We lost track of time as the rich smell of earth filled our noses until hunger struck, prompting us to search for an ideal spot to eat our lunch. Eventually, coming across a small clearing next to a cliff overlooking a stunning valley below. I hope you don't mind turkey sandwiches, I said to Titus as we sat down on a rock ledge. They're all I had left in my fridge. That's fine, he laughed. Anything tastes good when you're out here surrounded by such epic views. Several minutes into our lunch break, Titus pointed towards something caught in nearby bushes. 
At first glance, it appeared to be bloody scraps of cloth tangled within the branches. What could have possibly happened here? I wondered aloud. Titus shook his head, uncertain but visibly disturbed. We felt compelled to follow this strange trail through the brush, not anticipating how much worse things were about to become. As we advanced cautiously forward and the trail continued, eventually turning into something even more spine-chilling human remains scattered throughout various fragments of torn clothing. We stared in horror at this grotesque sight trying desperately to piece together what could have occurred here. Titus, visibly shaken, mumbled, We should get help. Before I could agree, we heard a distinct snapping sound, one that didn't belong to any other known creature in the woods. Every muscle in our bodies tensed up as the foreboding sound grew louder. It was then that we caught our first terrifying glimpse of the monstrous being that now stalked us through the underbrush. The creature's enormous body was covered in dark, leathery skin etched with scars. Hollow sockets where eyes should have been only magnified its sheer monstrosity. Rows upon rows of razor-sharp teeth filled its gaping maw, and its elongated limbs terminated into powerful claws capable of tearing through flesh and bone with ease. As the creature's presence became known, it prowled towards us with a primal grace that sent chills down my spine. Titus and I were both paralyzed by fear, desperately searching for anything resembling an escape route. My mind raced as I tried to think of some way out of our precarious situation. Suddenly seizing on a last-ditch solution, I grabbed my cell phone from my backpack and dialed 911 while attempting to keep the phone out of sight. What's your emergency? A calm voice on the other side asked. T, there's something hideous and monstrous here in these woods. I managed to stutter out. Where are you? We're going to need you, Dash. Just as I was about to offer some additional guidance on our location, the line abruptly went dead. The beast moved closer, still licking its lips in anticipation, forcing us up against the rock wall blocking our escape. With our backs pressed against the rock wall, Titus and I debated our next move. It was evident that reaching out to the authorities again might not be fruitful as there was no guarantee the call would remain connected. As the creature continued approaching, Titus spotted a narrow crevice on one side of the rock wall. It seemed just wide enough for us to squeeze through. We both exchanged silent nods and began moving cautiously towards the opening, all the while keeping our eyes on the horrors inching closer. As we entered the crevice, the monster sensed our movement and lunged towards us with lightning speed, its claws slashing through the air where we'd stood moments earlier. The narrow passage appeared to be tight enough to keep it from reaching us, but that didn't stop it from roaring in frustration and swiping at us with its massive claws. We continued pushing ourselves deeper into the crevice, holding onto tree roots and crawling over rocks. Desperation fueled us as we ignored cuts and bruises sustained in our bid to get away from the abomination. After what felt like hours, the sounds of pursuing terror faded behind us. We stumbled out of the crevice onto a steep incline covered with vines and slippery rocks. Having no other choice, Titus and I scrambled down as fast as we could manage despite our exhaustion. After reaching relatively flat ground once more, we were met with a dense forest which provided ample cover. It was then that we heard sirens in the distance. It seemed like our luck had finally turned. Perhaps our call had gotten through after all. We followed the sound until we came across a dirt road where multiple police vehicles were parked haphazardly. We ran towards them, frantically waving our arms in desperation for their attention. A couple of officers looked up in surprise before darting towards us in concern. As soon as they got close enough, 
They began asking about our welfare and the location of the creature we'd encountered. We provided as much information as we could, both of us struggling to keep our composure. They informed us that they'd received a garbled 911 call and managed to trace its rough location. It seemed like a miracle that they had reached us in time. Titus and I held back tears of relief upon hearing this. The officers set about organizing a team to locate and eliminate the monstrous being that had terrorized us all night. Using our encounter's description, they began scouring the surrounding area while keeping us safe at their makeshift base. The reality of the situation hit us then. We were alive, but others in those woods hadn't been so fortunate. We sat in silence as we watched the paramedics tend to our wounds and bodies being carefully retrieved from the woods by a somber rescue team, compassion and determination evident in their actions. As we finally left that dreadful place, knowing that something awful still prowled in those woods, our once peaceful love for nature tainted by bloodshed, Titus leaned in close, whispering one final question. Do you think they'll find it? The only answer I could muster was a quiet. I don't know. And we glanced back at the sinister forest one last time before moving ahead with hopes of reclaiming some semblance of normality in our lives. We hoped, with everything inside us, this nightmare would be over for good ideas discovered and put down, for us and for every precious life that faced its wrath. Our own survival was a bittersweet reminder that fortune could turn either way. One moment you're exploring nature with your best friend, the next you're stumbling upon gruesome carnage born from nightmares. Never once would we forget those who've fallen victim to that beast in the woods or let ourselves take any sense of comfort for granted ever again. My name is Atticus Benjamin, and up until recently, I was living the hermit life in a cozy old cabin hidden deep within the forests of Oregon. A serene landscape that would have been the perfect retreat for me if it weren't for the fact that I mistakenly ignored my buddy Clint's advice. A fearless risk-taker and all-around jokester, Clint had all sorts of speculative tales. And yet, in this particular case, I had overlooked his words with a passing interest. He always used to say, Atticus, don't step on that Baba Yaga's toes. The cabin where I lived was my fortress of solitude, a place free from distractions and interruptions. About four weeks ago, though, something felt truly off-kilter. It was a typical day. I returned from gathering waters at the nearby stream when swarms of flies covered the area around my homestead. It was as if some unseen force had unleashed an unnerving plague upon my sanctuary. Disturbing as it may sound, this was merely foreshadowing to the nightmare yet to unfold. A night like any other soon transformed into a terrifying experience as I sat comfortably at my wooden table reading a book by candlelight. My ears caught an odd rustling coming from just outside the window near the front door. The noise grew louder with each passing second. Unable to ignore it any longer, I hesitantly placed my book down and reached for my hunting shotgun hung over the fireplace mantel, purely precautionary. As I neared the front door to inspect the commotion outside, an odd odor hit me like a freight train, sulfur mixed with rotten eggs blended with what could only be decaying roadkill, a pungent cocktail of pure nausea. I cautiously opened the door to assess what sort of cruel prank Clint might have attempted to pull this time. Only this seemingly harmless prank turned into a full-blown atrocity. My jaw dropped and my legs nearly crumbled beneath me when from the darkness— a horrid creature emerged. Damning fortune, I curse myself for having taken Clint's humorous banter for granted. Before me stood a twisted beast-like fiend, 
towering well over eight feet tall with elongated limbs that seemed to defy the very laws of anatomy and thick, leathery skin coating its grotesque form. Its face was an ungodly sight, a symphony of malformations that inspired both terror and nausea. A set of razor-sharp teeth, too numerous to count, glistened in the sliver of moonlight passing through the trees. Without a thought for my safety, I aimed my shotgun directly at this vile monstrosity and pulled the trigger. The creature let out an ungodly shriek despite no visible damage that kicked my heart into overdrive. Primal instinct took control as I frantically began firing every ounce of ammunition I had kept on hand. The foul odor filled my nostrils as I unloaded every shell into the creature but it continued to advance despite the shotgun blasts. My hands shook with terror while my lungs begged for fresh air free of the repulsive stench. Realizing that my ammunition would be depleted soon, and this demon showed no signs of stopping, I began to back away from it. I desperately glanced around for an exit, fearing I had backed myself into a corner with the vicious abomination blocking my way. The sound of heavy footsteps approached fast. The powerful creature lunged at me, barely missing me as I evaded not a moment too soon. Its strikes left deep gouges in the wooden floor where I had been standing just seconds before. Knowing I wouldn't last long in close quarters with this monster, I made a quick decision and bolted for the back door, hoping to put some distance between us and perhaps find a better defense or some help. As I burst through the door, I heard a loud thud behind me. The beast was right on my tail. Ignoring the sharp pain in my side and the pounding in my chest, I sprinted toward the nearest house in an attempt to alert others of the creature pursuing me. As I pounded on the neighbor's door, hands trembling uncontrollably, I silently cursed myself for not calling for help sooner. Why hadn't I just grabbed the phone when I first felt something was wrong? The door opened quickly, revealing Mr. Johnson, my elderly neighbor who had lived in this area his entire life. His eyes widened with alarm at my panic-stricken expression before he quickly ushered me inside. Mr. Johnson! There's, there's something outside! I panted, struggling to catch my breath as he slammed the door shut behind us. What is it? An animal. Larger than that. This thing. It's after me. And it. The words got caught in my throat as I recalled the gruesome features of the creature. Mr. Johnson quickly locked the door and tightly gripped his rifle taking a defensive position near the windows while I explained the events he missed. Once I finished, we silently listened for any indications that demon had followed me. A crashing sound from outside sent shivers down my spine. Jonathan, get in the cellar! If this thing wants you, it can have you down there. Mr. Johnson pushed me towards the cellar door and began to barricade it behind me. The grating sound of metal scratching wood filled my ears as I cowered in the dark cellar. Mr. Johnson? I called out nervously, praying he was still okay. No response echoed back at me, only haunting silence. Time seemed an irrelevant measure. I remained in the dark with my heart pounding against my ribcage while my sweat-slicked palms tried to steady themselves on cold cellar walls ever fearful for Mr. Johnson and what could have befallen him upstairs. Finally mustering some courage, I slowly exited the cellar to find everything disturbingly quiet. Mr. Johnson's lifeless body lay crumpled on the floor, bloody gashes providing silent testimony to his brutal demise. My fight-or-flight response took over once again and though every fiber of my being screamed for me to flee in terror, I was determined not to leave another innocent life at this creature's mercy. 
Was shaking hands, I picked up Mr. Johnson's rifle and veered out into the night as a fierce determination overwhelmed me. Though by no means an investigator or warrior, it felt like something bigger than myself was pushing me on. As dawn claimed her rightful reign over our small town, a sight which would normally fill me with a sense of safety, I frantically continued my search for help from neighbors who had heard neither my cries nor our neighbors' screams. Traces of mangled corpses and inhuman destruction marked the wake of the creature. But as daylight persisted, the grisly remains left behind gave way to something more promising. Law enforcement and animal control arrived to investigate the carnage and face the beast head-on. In that moment, I could finally brave to hope that whatever horror had befallen our town might soon come to an end. But as day turned to night, an unsettling dread lingered that nothing would ever be the same again. A few years ago, I lost my job at a factory and decided to move into a cabin in the woods in rural Oregon. I had bought the cabin years before as a getaway. Now it would be my permanent residence. I found myself chuckling about what a comedy routine this could be. I was fired, so I left society to fend for myself. Does anyone else think this is hilarious? My name is Lawrence Collinsworth. And that week, there was a new missing persons report every day on the local news. It concerned me, but I took comfort being far removed from it all. My only interaction with people came during weekly visits to town for groceries and other necessities. One Saturday morning, my hair was like Einstein's, and I desperately needed groceries to prepare breakfast. I went into town to buy some supplies. When I reached the store, Mrs. Stanford, the cashier who was always good for a chuckle, asked me if the forest squirrels had run off with my comb. Laughing, we chatted for a bit before she mentioned that another local had gone missing. Larry, it's really getting strange out here. You're telling me. I replied with mock horror at my own predicament. The drive back to the cabin was dark and eerie unusual from mid-afternoon in rural Oregon. As I turned onto my driveway, there was something obscured by bushes up ahead. Joking to myself that it would be more squirrels trying to steal my supplies, I approached cautiously and saw what appeared to be a car with traces of blood around its doors. I noted the license plate and called 911 when I got to the cabin. A policeman arrived an hour later with startling news. It belonged to one of those who had gone missing recently. Now you've really got me spooked, he remarked as he started examining the scene more closely. An audible high-pitched screech echoed through the trees, causing us to shudder. Suddenly, a grotesque creature emerged from the thick forest. It stood over eight feet tall with long twisted arms ending in dagger-like claws. Inhuman eyes stared us down as translucent skin spread across its sinewy frame. The cop grabbed me by the arm and shouted, Run! We sprinted towards my cabin as the nightmare stalked behind us at breakneck speed. In sheer terror, we slammed and secured the heavy oak door. Now what? I gasped. Regretting that I hadn't brought a gun or any weapon along with me when I moved into the cabin. We have to warn the others. He responded. Call your neighbors anyone you know who's still in town. Feeling utterly defenseless against this beast, I called everyone within a ten-mile radius of my cabin, urging them to take shelter immediately. Calls dropped, but I hoped they'd understand the danger looming just outside. We peered through boards covering my window and saw the creature lurking near the bloody car, growling infuriated that it was unable to get to us. The policeman wrestled with his radio, trying to call for backup while thoughts started around my head how was it so fast. 
How could something like this exist in our world? Could we escape? We knew we couldn't stay inside and wait for help that might not come. The creature paced around our perimeter waiting to sink its teeth into us. If not now, then when help arrived. Do you have a back door? whispered the cop urgently. I do, I nodded hesitantly. But by now it will know it can't get in that way either. He sighed heavily and carefully opened one of my bedroom windows. It led to dense woods on a trail known only to me. We couldn't sit inside forever. We had to escape or find help. The cop looked at me and said, We're going to use that trail of yours. We have to get to the next nearest cabin and alert them too. If we can summon enough people, maybe we can trap or kill this thing together. With trembling hands, I drew him a crude map of the trail, explaining which turns were safe and which ones led to dead ends, only hoping that the creature hadn't figured out our plan. When night fell, we waited until the creature seemed occupied on the other side of the cabin before we made our move. We crawled out of the window and stepped quietly onto the forest floor. Every twig snap made me wince, fearing it would give away our location. We stayed low and moved quickly through the woods. The cop guided us based on my directions while I scanned every shadow for a sign of that terrifying creature. Our rapid footsteps were muffled by the thick layer of leaves, but still seemed too loud in the otherwise quiet forest. We reached the neighboring cabin, with no sign of the creature behind us. Once inside with our newfound allies, a burly bearded man and his teenage son, we discussed our strategy. The best thing we can do is set traps, the bearded man suggested. Like bear traps and such maybe even use ourselves as bait. It was a risky plan, but it seemed like our only chance at survival. Taking every possible precaution, we set up our bear traps around each cabin in case it circled back. Then we sprinted along the forest floor towards another cabin further down, praying the creature hadn't caught on to our movements. At every cabin we visited, we gained more supporters, all urging their neighbors to join us against this monstrous enemy. After amassing an army of terrified but determined residents armed with whatever makeshift weapons they could find, we returned to my cabin. With bait stationed at each cabin, we tried to lure the creature into our traps. It worked. The inhuman screech echoed through the air as one of our traps clamped shut, capturing the menacing creature. We rushed towards the sound, only to find its mangled leg trapped between heavy metal teeth. It writhed and snarled at us in pain and anger. The bearded man, with an axe in hand, charged towards it. The axe fell hard on its twisted arms severing them from its body, but it only took seconds for the creature to tear free from the trap and lunge at him. The bearded man fell, screaming, as the creature ripped open his throat. Chaos ensued as multiple people tried to attack the beast, while others desperately sought refuge in their cabins. Under the chaotic symphony of hammers and knives smashing against its twisted body, Mixed with the snarls from the creature itself and screams of pain from those it managed to get its claws on, victory prevailed. Finally, seemingly overwhelmed, the creature made a final attempt at retreat, too weak to fight any longer. Exhausted but determined, we pursued it till it collapsed and drew its last wheezing breaths before expiring in front of us. We stared at our bloodied foe with a mixture of disbelief and admiration for our own survival. The atmosphere turned somber then as we looked around, realizing just how many lives had been lost in this brutal battle against an unknown evil. Tearful eulogies were spoken as we buried our dead friends in a small graveyard near the woods that once brought tranquility but now held sinister memories. Though we found solace in knowing that this horrific fiend would no longer plague us or anyone else ever again, 
There was no true comfort as our lives had forever changed from witnessing such grotesque violence firsthand. I was never fond of the woods, but when I inherited my Uncle Calvin's cabin, it felt like the perfect escape from the mundane urban life. Everyone called me Davy Harrison back in the city, mostly due to my knack for uncovering little-known historical facts and sharing them with friends over a beer. My first week at the cabin was quiet, uneventful, and dare I say, relaxing. If only I had known what lay ahead for me. It all changed on my daily jog. As usual, I followed the trail that led deep into the lush forest around Lake Clearwater in southern Utah. Erratic footprints broke my reverie way bigger than any animal I knew roamed these woods. Curious and alarmed, I decided to follow them out of sheer curiosity and yes, maybe stupidity as well. The tracks turned off at a strange angle leading towards a dense thicket. I stumbled upon a scene that would haunt me forever an unsettling sight of torn clothes and mutilated human remains scattered across a small clearing. In an instant, heavy footsteps echoed behind me. Instinctively, I ducked behind a nearby tree just as an enormous creature revealed itself on the other side of the thicket. With no time to even process what stood before me, I felt my jaw drop as my eyes took in the horror of its appearance a grotesque monstrosity half-humanoid and half-beast with snarling teeth dripping with saliva and covered in sickly matted fur that reeked of decay and death itself. Unable to tear my gaze away from it, my mind was racing when Fred Collins another cabin owner nearby burst through the trees pointing his rifle at this aberration. What in God's name is that? He shouted hoarsely, visibly shaken by what stood before us. But his fear didn't stop him from shooting at that thing multiple times, with each bullet apparently doing nothing but enraging the beast. With unnatural speed, the creature lunged at Fred who was barely able to scramble away. Through luck or destiny, his shots must have struck something vital, as the monster limped and howled in pain. Run, Davy! Fred screamed at me. I'll hold it off. Just get out of here! His panicked words spurred my body into action. I couldn't just let this happen to him, though. Quickly formulating a plan, I yelled back. Fred, lead it to the lake. I have an idea. My mind flooded with childhood memories of studying various chemical reactions ammonium nitrate reacting violently when heated in water. Why not use Uncle Calvin's stash of fertilizers to our advantage? As we sprinted towards Lake Clearwater, I desperately hoped that my makeshift bomb would buy us enough time to escape this nightmare. Reaching the lake before us, the creature waded into the shallow waters, its twisted face contorted in rage and confusion. It was now or never— I lit a makeshift fuse on my bag of ammonium nitrate and hurled it towards the creature just as it was about to lunge at us again. The violent reaction caught it off guard. A deafening explosion reverberated through the air followed by a cacophony of otherworldly shrieks. The ghastly beast thrashed helplessly in an explosive flash that clouded my vision. With a horrified glance at Fred, I knew that we were both out of options and out of time. We sprinted deeper into the woods away from the shocking scene unfolding behind us, a ghastly monstrosity thrashing in raging flames on a spiraling descent into chaos. Fred and I ran deeper into the woods, our breaths coming in gasps. The sound of chaos grew fainter behind us as we left Lake Clearwater and the creature far behind us. We couldn't help but feel relief that the explosion had seemed to at least disable the creature temporarily. But despite this temporary reprieve, we knew we couldn't continue like this. We needed help, more than ever, 
We needed to get others involved who could help us combat the horrors that stalked our little town. As we slowed from a sprint to a brisk jog and finally caught our breath, Fred took out his cell phone. His hands shook as he dialed 911, explaining in gasps and incomplete sentences just what had happened during the call. I could tell from his expression that the operator was skeptical of the story, but her professional duty prevailed when she promised that a team would be dispatched to assess our situation. Fred hung up with a nod of acknowledgement, pocketing his phone as he exchanged an uncertain look with me. We continued moving through the woods towards town, guided by the distant glow of streetlights that acted as a beacon of hope. As we moved silently, every rustle in the undergrowth made us start in fear. Our senses were heightened, acutely aware of every noise around us. Without warning, an enormous shadow emerged from behind a thick cluster of bushes ahead of us, its silhouette eerily familiar. The creature had found us again had it somehow managed to follow us despite being rendered helpless in the explosion. Its limbs were covered in burns and loose skin hung off them in tatters. Fred and I froze for a moment before turning on our heels and running back towards Lake Clearwater, praying that it wouldn't catch up with us before help arrived. The creature gained on us but we could see the blue flashing lights getting closer and closer as emergency vehicles approached our location. The sound of sirens drowned out the creature's roar that echoed through the woods, and the ground seemed to shake beneath us. Suddenly, several trucks emerged, blocking off our path and forcing us to stop. The creature lunged at us, infuriated and in pain. A group of law enforcement officers rushed forward, armed with rifles and not hesitating to fire upon the villainous beast before it could reach us. The bullets tore through the creature's body, slowing it down as it staggered towards us. Its blood splattered across the forest floor, creating a macabre scene unlike anything we had ever witnessed. Finally, a police officer fired one last shot that seemed to finish the monster. It emitted a horrific screech as it collapsed to the ground. Relief washed over me as I realized that the nightmare was finally over. While law enforcement officers debated how to handle the remains of our attacker, Fred and I huddled together by one of their vehicles. We were so relieved that help had arrived when it did, though we knew there would be no going back from witnessing such horrors in our small town. Whether because of what we had been through or simply out of respect for our ordeal, nobody asked for an explanation about the ammonium nitrate explosion or what had really happened during that horrifying encounter in Lake Clearwater Woods. As we all watched smoke rise from where Uncle Calvin's stash once was buried on the lake shoreline, I couldn't help but feel haunted by that grotesque creature's final moments. And though Fred and I exchanged withered smiles of exhaustion for having survived this ordeal together, we could both tell something inside us had changed beyond repair. That day marked not just an end to our encounter with something far more sinister than we could ever have imagined. It marked an end to our innocence forever stolen by that tragic evening when our lives were upended by an unspeakable horror that was just as swiftly delivered to justice. I came to this isolated cabin as part of a lifelong desire to eliminate distractions and focus on my writing career. My name is Grayson Lancaster, and I was relieved when I stumbled upon this place deep in the heart of the woods in Oregon. As the days went by, I became familiar with my surroundings. The thick trees that encircled the cabin provided comfort and serenity while simultaneously casting a sense of paranoia due to the lack of human presence within the vicinity. I met a fellow named Alex Tanner, who worked at the local grocery store where I would stock up on my supplies every week. 
We shared stories and jokes together during those brief encounters, becoming fast friends in this otherwise isolated existence. During one of these casual conversations, Alex mentioned weird noises he had been hearing lately from the woods something akin to an animal shrieking yet far more disturbing than any known creature. He brushed it off as nothing more than his mind playing tricks on him. We laughed about it, but deep down there was a hint of unnerving unease in both of us. One weekend, after returning from a trip to town with my supply haul, I discovered fresh crimson splatters near my front porch. The sight jolted me there was no one around for miles. Could it be wild animals fighting? After cleaning up the mess, I started noticing other peculiar happenings around me. First, there were claw marks on some trees nearby deep grooves no animal we knew could be responsible for. Then there were unusual tracks leading to and away from my front door. These weren't hoof or paw prints but rather resembled something almost humanoid with elongated toes. Each day brought about new discoveries, provoking untold anxiety within me. One morning, while sitting on my porch sipping coffee, Alex dropped by unexpectedly looking more disheveled than usual. Hey man, he said after a moment of silence. I saw those tracks you mentioned the other day, and they led me to this place. He paused, swallowed hard, and continued. Nearby, I found this nest. It was made of sticks and leaves, big enough to fit a person. We decided to investigate the nest together. Armed with flashlights and whatever makeshift weapons we could find, Alex and I stealthily made our way through the woods our senses heightened in the growing darkness. Just as we were getting closer to the nest Alex previously mentioned, we heard an eerie sound echoing through the trees, that same gut-wrenching cry I heard him describe. This time, though, it was alarmingly close. Our eyes scanned the area frantically. Suddenly, there it was standing several feet from us. Its back turned at first, a tall, gaunt creature covered in matted fur with sickeningly long limbs ending in claw-like fingers. Quivering in fear, we barely had time to react before it noticed our presence and spun around. Its piercing yellow eyes met ours as it emitted a shrill scream that caused my heart to nearly rupture from terror. It lunged at us with astonishing speed for its size narrowly missing me as I dove out of the way. In response, Alex fired on the monster with his hunting rifle. No! It has me! Agonized cries filled my ears as sharp claws sunk deep into Alex's shoulder. It began dragging him away as he struggled desperately against its unrelenting grip. In a state of panic, I yelled at the top of my lungs, Help! Someone help us! But the creature didn't stop as it continued to drag Alex away. The forest seemed empty and uncaring to our plight. Noticing a nearby large rock, I grabbed it with all my strength and hurled it at the creature's head. It struck true, causing the monster to release its grip on Alex. It turned and snarled at me, saliva dripping from its twisted maw. I glanced at Alex who was lying on the ground clutching his injured shoulder. Run, man! Get out of here! I shouted at him. He hesitated for a moment before limping away as fast as his battered body would allow. With its focus now on me, I knew that I had to survive this encounter somehow. I sprinted further into the woods hoping to find some way to escape or perhaps encounter someone else who could help. The creature chased after me relentlessly, its elongated limbs allowing it remarkable speed despite its massive size. It knocked down trees in its path as if they were mere paper barriers. Desperate for help and realizing I couldn't outrun it forever, I pulled out my phone and dialed 911. Gasping for brief between words, I frantically explained our situation. Please, I said between ragged breaths. 
We need help now. My friend is injured and there's some sort of animal attacking us. The dispatcher promised to send units as soon as possible, but warned that given our location in the forest, help would not arrive for quite some time. I hung up and continued running, but the creature was still hot on my heels. My mind raced with thoughts on how to survive this encounter that seemed more hopeless by the second. I spotted a deep ravine up ahead. Perhaps if I could make it across somehow, it would give me the space I needed to escape. I sprinted towards it, realizing that this could be my last chance. As I neared the edge of the ravine, I spotted a fallen tree bridging the gap. Without hesitation, I dashed across, praying not to lose my footing. The creature, undeterred by the ravine, lunged and caught hold of the tree itself, shaking it violently and causing me to stumble. I rolled to the other side just in time as it broke beneath the creature's weight. It fell into the ravine with a bellowing scream. I struggled to my feet, heart pounding in my chest like a jackhammer. Its fall didn't guarantee escape. I knew that staying around would be risky. And there was still Alex, lying injured and vulnerable somewhere within this horrid forest. I made my way back to where I last saw him. He was unconscious but breathing, eyes glazed over by pain and shock. As best as I could manage, I carried him out of the woods while awaiting help. Hours later... We were both being treated in a local hospital, our injuries reminiscent of some horrifying battle against a foe unlike any other. In time, authorities searched the woods for signs of our attacker but no trace was ever found. The few people we managed to recount our experience to responded with either skepticism or abandonment. Did they think we were mad? Regardless of whether anyone believed our story or not, this gruesome encounter had forever changed us. Fueled by an unspoken agreement between us both, we decided to leave that place behind. No more idyllic afternoons on porches or talks in familiar streets. Gone were those days beneath serene forests, with warm smiles and laughter spilling forth like a summer breeze. In their stead lay memories now stained with blood, pain, and terror intertwined with a creature whose true nature remained unknown. We could never forget the lives we lost and the parts of ourselves left behind in that dark forest. I'm Jack, a solitary figure in life with an affinity for living off the grid. For years now, I'd been living in my cabin deep in the Appalachian woods, far away from civilization. Its quiet ways have always given me a sense of comfort and peace. I love the contrast between the liveliness of the forest and the calmness of my small, isolated patch of land. I remember that fateful hike I was taking through the woods behind my cabin just before everything changed. The air felt dense with moisture and the silence was uncanny. As I walked further into the forest, I stumbled upon a bizarre scene that both intrigued and disturbed me, a pile of human bones neatly stacked against a tree trunk. I wouldn't consider myself squeamish or prone to panic, especially not given my choice of living in these secluded woods. But that day, it felt like something strange and even sinister was lurking amongst the silent trees. As time went on since that horrifying discovery, I started noticing peculiar things around my cabin. Crumbled leaves trampled underfoot outside my windows at night and an eerie chill in the air even during daylight hours, unlike anything I'd experienced during my time here. Through it all, However bitter circumstances may have been, laughter still occasionally cascaded through these once tranquil woods as Maxine, Blake, and Nadia kept me company when they'd visit from time to time. Blake regaled us with his odd penchant for off-kilter humor. 
He joked about us being trapped in a cliché horror movie and awaiting our peculiar doom courtesy of a masked killer emerging from behind dimly lit trees. What if we find ourselves hunted by some demented creature? Blake mused one night over a bonfire. Okay, Maxine chortled as she sipped her whiskey through a grin. I vote Jack gets eaten first. Way to show gratitude for saving your life last fall, Maxine, I said sarcastically, recalling the fateful day when she fell and broke her ankle during a hike, and I nursed her back to health. We laughed it off, trying our best not to dwell on the unexplained, odd occurrences around my cabin. But privately, the unease persisted. One moonlit night several weeks later, the four of us gathered at my cabin for our planned getaway. I was busy preparing a delightful dinner in the kitchen when sounds from the forest yanked me back to reality. A horrendous mix of roaring and gut-wrenching crunching echoed through the trees. The others heard it too and rushed outside to find out what was going on. We armed ourselves with whatever we could gather in a hurry. Crowbars, machetes a rusty pitchfork, anything to make us feel safer with whatever we were about to face. Venturing further into the forest, we discovered what could have been another dimension or something more terrifying yet found nowhere else on earth, an area strewn with disfigured corpses. Some beyond recognition while others twisted and mangled in ways that defied all logic. And then we saw it, silhouetted against the moonlight a tall creature with long limbs egregiously contorted, looming over one of its victims like a vulture over carrion. Its mouth held jagged teeth embedded in blackened gums that seemed to drool malice itself as blood dripped off its chin. It was unlike anything I'd seen or imagined in my wildest dreams. In that moment of terror, I yelled out to my friends to run back to the cabin. Each of us sprinted, not daring to look back at the horrifying creature we had witnessed. Gasping for breath, we managed to make it back and barricaded ourselves inside. Guys, we need to call for help! Jack screamed amid panicked breaths. Blake tried dialing the police while Sarah and I searched for more ways to fortify the cabin's entrance. Unfortunately, we quickly realized that we were out in the woods and our phones had no signal. What do we do? We can't stay here forever, Maxine said with fear in her voice as she examined our makeshift barricade. We don't have a choice right now, Maxine, Jack replied, gripping his crowbar tightly. Stay alert, everyone. I could tell they were all terrified after witnessing such a monstrous creature. We remained silent and listened intently for any sound of danger approaching. Much time passed when suddenly, our worst fears were realized. The creature stormed against the door with brute force, its animalistic growls sending shockwaves through our very being. What do we do? It's trying to get in. Sarah screamed as tears streamed down her face. Get the keys! We'll need to make a break for the car. I shouted, trying to think through the panic engulfing us all. Miraculously, Maxine found the keys amidst all the chaos. Got them. Let's go. We made our way through a side window as quietly as possible, while the enraged beast continued pounding at the door. In the darkness of night, guided only by fear and determination, we sprinted towards my parked vehicle nearby. Just as Blake reached out to open one of the car doors, gut-wrenching screams filled the air behind us it was Jack being brutally mauled by that monstrous being. It had caught up to us faster than we had imagined possible. Gee guys, go! Jack stuttered as blood oozed from his severe wounds, urging us with whatever strength was left within him. Heartbroken and horrified, we knew we had no choice but to abandon our friend for the sake of our own survival. We piled into the car, Maxine fumbling with the keys and revving the engine to life. 
Tears streamed down our faces as we sped away from the unfathomable terror that had shattered our once peaceful retreat. In tears, each of us tried to process what we had just witnessed as well as the loss of Jack, a dear friend whose life was cut short by an indescribable monster. We drove all night until we reached civilization early the following morning. As we walked into a local police station to report the gruesome events of the night before, reality began to set in. Our lives would never be the same again after what we experienced in those woods. We mourned Jack's tragic death and tried our best to share a detailed description of what transpired and the appearance of that sinister creature with law enforcement officials. However, there was little they could do other than send search parties out looking for evidence of our horrifying encounter and poor Jack's remains. Many days passed, and despite their efforts, nothing concrete emerged no bodies, no clues. It was as if the forest itself had swallowed up every trace of that terrifying ordeal. We held a memorial service for Jack reminiscing about his bravery and compassionate spirit in hopes that it might bring some semblance of closure. But deep down inside, I knew I'd never forget what happened in those woods or shake off the terrible guilt that would haunt me for eternity. My name is Chester Warner and this was by no means a typical day for me. As I sat on the porch of my secluded forest cabin, the refreshing taste of freshly brewed coffee lingered on my tongue while I struggled to solve the massive crossword puzzle sprawled before me. I make it a habit to challenge my mind in my free time, but today's puzzle seemed especially perplexing. My best friend, Dexter Myers, laughed from his rocking chair nearby. Careful there, Chester. You might sprain your brain, he quipped playfully, taking a long swig from his thermos. I rolled my eyes at him. Oh, come on now, Dex. Just because you haven't got the patience for something like this. Just then, an ear-piercing scream split through the tranquility of our quiet woods retreat. In no time at all, Dexter and I dropped everything we were doing and sprinted into the forest, compelled by human instinct to help whoever was in distress. Following the sound, we barged into a rare clearing in the dense trees where we found a young man with scratches and gashes all over his body. He was crouched on the ground atop a crimson-stained patch of grass within a large circle of disturbed earth. A mangled backpack lay near him. What happened? I shouted as I rushed to his aid. The trembling man looked up at us, eyes wide with terror. It. It was massive, long claws, gleaming teeth. He kept trying to form more coherent sentences as Dexter tried to calm him down. Did you get a good look at this creature? Dexter asked urgently. No, too fast, he stammered still trembling uncontrollably. Discovering that there was no phone reception in the area and unable to wait for medical help due to what we had seen as life-threatening injuries, we decided that it was best for Dexter to carry the injured man back to our cabin. As we made our way back, we could all feel a deeply rooted dread sinking into us like thorns. Upon our arrival, I draped a blanket around the young man and did my best to clean his wounds. It took all my willpower not to gag as I removed dirt from gashes and bandaged up a profusely bleeding arm. You said this creature had long, sharp claws? Dexter asked the visibly shaken victim as he rummaged through the stocked first aid supplies. Yeah. He paused, swallowed hard, and continued. It was almost like it possessed razor-sharp blades where its fingers should have been. The injured man, whom we'd managed to learn was named Everett Hammond, slowly began regaining some color and strength as I finished tending to his injuries. 
It didn't take long for us to realize that with night swiftly falling and no phone signal or other means of contact, going out into the woods again wasn't an option. We prepared dinner silently, except for the occasional whimper from Everett, who had moved closer to the fire that now roared in the fireplace. We tried to get our minds off what had happened earlier but found little success in that regard. As we settled into bed later that night, I couldn't help but wonder what kind of creature lurked within these once peaceful woods. One with such razor-sharp weapons at its disposal raised questions that I knew needed answers but wouldn't be found here. Hours after we had turned out the lights and slipped under the covers— a low growling sound echoed through the cabin. This time not one of us hesitated for even a moment. Our instincts kicked in, urging us into action with an efficiency either of us knew we possessed. We grabbed flashlights and kitchen knives before storming out of the cabin in search of whatever had harmed Everett. As the sounds grew closer, more visceral, we knew we were nearing it. From the darkness... A hulking mass materialized into our flashlight beams, a horrifying beast unlike anything we'd ever seen before. Covered in coarse, matted fur and boasting a row of incredibly sharp teeth that seemed to glimmer beneath our light, this monstrous antagonist advanced in predatory leaps and bounds. As it fixed its unblinking, yellow eyes on us, Dex's voice wavered. How? How can something like this even exist beyond nightmares? He whispered. It charged towards us, the stench of blood foul in the air. We didn't have weapons strong enough to confront it. We were only equipped with kitchen knives and our feeble courage. Right then, I wished we could call for help. However, there was no signal to connect our calls, and shouting for assistance would only make us more alluring prey. Gripped with fear, we reluctantly dispersed in different directions, our survival instincts taking over as our only hope was to outrun and outsmart the beast. Dex and Everett hastily climbed up a tree as I slid behind a large fallen log. The monstrous being leaped after them first, its powerful limbs tearing through the bark as it tried to reach them. The sound of splintering would accompany Everett's anguished cry. He plummeted to the ground with a terrible thud, his body motionless under the impossibly tall beast. It bent down, razor-sharp teeth sinking into his limbs as it tore him apart with contemptuous ease. No! Dex cried in horror from his perch above. The creature turned its head towards him, but he hurled himself onto a nearby branch and started jumping from tree to tree like a desperate squirrel escaping a predator. The gruesome scene unfolding before me tugged at my resolve. I knew I had to distract the beast long enough for Dex to escape. Picking up a rock, I hurled it at the creature's head with all my strength. It made contact, eliciting an enraged growl from the monster that promised retribution. Luring it away from Dex, I dashed into the forest depths as fast as my lungs allowed. The snapping of branches and guttural growls alerted me that it wasn't far behind. My mind raced with various escape plans, but nothing concrete formed. All I could think about was getting far away from this horrifying fiend. Inevitably, my exhaustion caught up with me, and I stumbled into a small clearing. With no strength left to run, I pushed myself in the direction of a shallow cave nearby. My heartbeat thundered in my ears as I crawled deeper into the darkness, praying that the creature wouldn't find me. The sound of its growls lessened as time wore on, briefly injecting hope into my weary body. But it shattered as I heard Dex's screams from somewhere in the distance, a signal that he hadn't evaded the predator after all. When silence finally descended upon us and darkness enveloped everything, it felt like an eternity had passed. Shaking from cold and fear, I crawled out of the cave with a heavy heart. Everett and Dex were gone, 
claimed by the unknown beast that had slaughtered them mercilessly. I made my way back to the cabin in solitude, aware of every shadow that lurked around me. Locking the door behind me, I barricaded myself inside for what remained of that fateful night. As dawn broke and sunlight peeked through the curtains, I emerged from my hiding place, battered and grieving. But there was no time for mourning. I knew I had to get out of these woods and return to civilization. Finding the car keys amid the chaos inside the cabin, I started the engine with trembling hands and sped off towards safety. The forest soon disappeared behind me as if consumed by a nightmare that refused to release its grip. Back in town, I reported the events to local authorities but sheltered them from some gruesome details, both for their benefit and mine. They conducted a search but found nothing except remnants of a struggle, broken branches and blood stains leading nowhere. Everett Hammond and Dex would be forever etched in my memory as victims of a terror that haunted those woods. To this day, there are no answers as to what provoked such viciousness from a beast that resembled something straight out of a nightmare. And perhaps some questions are better left unanswered leaving the forest to hold its secrets close to its tormented heart. My simple life had always been uneventful, even boring at times. My name is Arnold Ryder, and I live a quiet existence in a small, modest cabin in the woods in rural Montana. I had come to appreciate the solitude and beauty of the wilderness around me. I was content simply sticking to my daily routine, a perfect mix of chores and leisure activities that included long walks through the woods and exploring the surrounding area. One morning, on one of these walks, I accidentally stumbled into a grisly scene that served as a powerful prelude to my terrifying encounter with the unknown. Dozens of mauled animal corpses were strewn all over a clearing not far from my cabin. The blood was still fresh, leaving me to wonder how such a massive assault could have taken place without me hearing it. Unsettled but foolishly curious, I followed an erratic trail of blood leading away from the site. As I continued on this gruesome path, fear not at my heart like a thousand tiny mice nibbling on cheese. I couldn't call for help because the nearest decent cell phone reception was miles away, beyond the dense forest that now held a sinister aura. Evening approached as I stumbled upon something so disturbing that it halted me in my tracks. It was an effigy made from parts of various animals twisted together and hung from an old rotten tree. There was something deeply unsettling about this nefarious contraption that sent shivers down my spine. Despite my growing dread, my curiosity drove me further into the wood's depths. As darkness closed in, my fears reached new heights. Strange scraping sounds echoed through the trees, as though metal claws scratched across stone. Heart racing. I realized then that perhaps venturing so far away from my cabin had been unwise after all. Carefully retracing my steps and gripping onto a rusty knife for protection, cold comfort considering its dull blade, anything seemed better than venturing further into the forest blindly at this point. But while my breath hitched at any little noise, I couldn't deny a morbid sense of excitement. As I neared my cabin, I noticed eerie footprints, far too big to be a human's, leading up to and away from the door. Torn by fear yet eager for answers, I hesitated once more before drawing closer. Peeking from behind a tree nearby, I saw the creature responsible for all the destruction, a massive beast covered in patches of black and dark green fur, with wide leathery wings that span wider than any ordinary truck. Only taking a few steps closer, and with trembling hands holding on to my tragically useless weapon, I caught a fleeting glimpse of its face just as it sensed my presence. 
along with its fearsomely sharp teeth and large amber eyes. Protruding horns adorned its head, and long talons gleamed like polished silver. It snarled at me, a deeply menacing warning that shook me to my core. Without another second to react, our standoff was interrupted by my best friend Sarah's voice. Arnold! Where have you been? Did you really leave Dash? She froze mid-sentence upon seeing the incredible monstrosity staring her down with predatory intent. Realizing we were outnumbered and outmatched in every possible way, I quickly built up any ounce of courage I had left in me. In an explosive jolt, driven by the knowledge of our imminent doom if we didn't act, we sprinted away from the creature back towards our only hope my small but sturdy cabin. As we dashed towards safety, one glance back was all I needed to see it take to the skies with powerful winged beats that sent strong gusts of wind in our direction. Undeterred by branches whipping our faces or the intense burning in our lungs that screamed for us to stop, we desperately clung to the hope that we'd enter the cabin before our monstrous pursuer reached us. We tore inside the cabin in a frenzy, slamming the door behind us, and rummaging through our belongings for anything we could use to barricade ourselves from the flying beast outside. We found an old wardrobe and refrigerator, which with combined effort, we were able to shove against the door. As much as we wanted to call for help, there was merely one landline phone in the cabin and to our dismay, the creature severing the phone line as it followed us into the woods ruined any possibility of communication with others. Sarah began frantically searching for any means of distraction for the beast while I haphazardly scurried for weapons, perhaps a sharp kitchen knife or a baseball bat, anything that could be of assistance. The creature crashed into the wall with a blood-curdling growl, weakening the already old cabin. Rumbles vibrated through our bones as debris coated us. It intensified our panic. Spotting an iron poker sitting by the fireplace, Sarah quickly grappled it with trembling hands. Meanwhile, I found a hunting rifle and its matching ammunition. Although we harbored no intention of using these weapons on such a terrifyingly powerful adversary, having them provided us with just enough reserve to execute our next plan. Huddling together, whispers conveyed our strategy, creating a diversion which would allow at least one of us to bolt towards my truck parked outside. Utilizing my lighter and an old can of gasoline I had nearby, I formulated a makeshift grenade. Sarah flung open one of the windows near her location as I tossed our fiery creation onto the creature in hopes that this temporary assault would buy us enough time to escape. Engulfed in flames, its howl echoed through the night as Sarah leaped out through the window, poker tightly gripped in her hand, and sprinted towards my truck. The monster swiveled around aiming its fury at me, smoke billowed from its burned hide. Hesitating to follow Sarah, I couldn't help but gawk at the monstrosity before me. The sheer terror it exuded made my heart hammer in my chest as if threatening to burst out. Despite my trepidation, I was aware that this gruesome figure had a history, a life, and it was reluctant to allow us to forget our brush with death. Gripping the rifle, I took a trembling step backward out of the window struggling to maintain eye contact with the creature. It snarled at me as I stumbled and fell onto the ground, struggling to rise. Unbeknownst to me, Sarah had maneuvered herself back towards the cabin after realizing I would never make it to the truck safely alone. She charged towards the creature with her weapon of choice. Despite both our attempts at remaining alive at any cost, we never imagined actually fighting this colossal beast with feeble human weapons. Nevertheless, Sarah's determination was unmatched as she swung the poker down. The creature flinched as it landed on its fiery skin but showed no signs of surrender, its will to conquer overwhelming its pain threshold. 
Sarah gasped just long enough for our horrifying nefarious nemesis to tear into her flesh quickly, mauling her within seconds. I couldn't contain my anguish at witnessing Sarah's demise and fired a shot from the rifle, though sorely aware that bullets were ineffective against such an abomination. To my utmost disbelief, the thunderous sound from my clumsy shot shattered the creature's eardrums. It screeched in agony and lurched backwards in shock. Gathering every remaining ounce of strength, I sprinted towards my truck and fumbled for the keys as tears blinded me. Every convulsive sob was released due to unbearable guilt. If only we hadn't made a stand against this monster, Sarah might have still been alive. Igniting the engine and flooring the gas pedal, I tore out of the woods, leaving the cabin and the creature far behind. But even at this relentless distance, I remained haunted forever by Sarah's demise and our doomed encounter with that maleficent beast. I was in the middle of my morning routine, shaving off the scruffy beard I neglected for several days when I heard it for the first time. A single faint, distant scream that sent a shiver down my spine. It had been about a month since I had moved into this isolated cabin. My lone residence nestled deep within Idaho's heavily wooded Starkey area, in its pristine and largely untouched forest. My name's Orson Grimes, by the way. As I quickly wiped the remaining shaving cream from my face, I tried to push aside my feelings of unease. Was that just a trick my mind was playing on me? Or should I be concerned? I decided not to overthink too much about it and went on with my day. The hustle and bustle of city life were far behind me but with my new remote location came its own unique set of challenges. Soon enough, word spread throughout our small community about people disappearing without a trace. In those discussions around town, some people tossed around dark jokes in an effort to lighten an otherwise grim reality. One particular guy, Sheldon Fielder, had a bizarre sense of humor and always managed to crack us up. Hey Orson! He chuckled one day while we filled our jugs with water at the nearby spring. Maybe it's aliens coming down to take us all away. They just can't resist our lovely faces. I laughed along with him, but deep down, the fear began to crawl underneath my skin. As weeks turned into months, familiar faces around town vanished one by one, each disappearance leaving only morbid clues behind. Traces of blood, torn scraps of clothing or broken personal items, all suggesting horrific outcomes. Even local law enforcement couldn't quite figure out what was happening. Our little part of the world seemed so peaceful before all this began. But then one day, it finally came for me too. I had been chopping firewood in the small clearing behind my cabin when that eerie feeling washed over me again. The forest had gone completely silent, no bird song or rustling in the underbrush. I glanced around cautiously, my grip on the axe tightening with every pounding heartbeat. Moments later, a pungent stench assaulted my nostrils and my spine stiffened. There, in the corner of my vision, that thing emerged from the dense thicket. It was a terrifying, grotesque creature that defied description. A mingling of distorted animal forms merged into a hauntingly monstrous being. Its jagged teeth hung limply outside of its flabby jaw as drool dripped down onto already soaked ground beneath it. Oozing sores dotted its patchy fur, and every gasping breath it took seemed to rattle its very bones. It was as if Mother Nature herself had Frankenstein ed together this unholy terror. Suddenly, the creature lunged at me with alarming speed. I managed to dodge its strike and swing my axe at it in one swift motion, connecting with its side, but instead of slashing through flesh and bone, 
My axe's blade seemed to bounce off with a sickening. Thwack. The beast snarled at me in anger, saliva splattering across the forest floor. My heart raced in terror as it revealed even more of its twisted form. Was this even real? Was this the beast behind all those disappearances? With bated breath, I readied myself for another strike. But suddenly the creature stopped dead in its tracks. It sniffed the air as if it could sense something else approaching, and then bolted back into the brush just as quickly as it had come. In the aftermath of the creature's sudden departure, I stood there, trembling uncontrollably. My ears were strained, listening for any sound or movement. My eyes continuously scanned the forest. Never before had I felt so vulnerable and helpless in my life. I knew that I needed to call for help, but the nearest town was miles away, and cell reception was poor at best. Despite this knowledge, I fumbled for my phone from my pocket, desperately hoping for a signal. To my utter relief, I found that I had one bar enough to make an emergency call. Nearly dropping the phone from my quivering hands, I managed to punch in the emergency number. A woman on the other end answered. 911, what's your emergency? In a panic-stricken voice, I recounted the harrowing encounter with the monstrous creature how it had attacked me and suddenly retreated while trying to provide my location in the dense woods. There was a pause from her end before she responded. Stay where you are. We'll have someone out there as soon as possible. As I waited for help to arrive, fear gnawed at me with each passing second, thinking about how many others had fallen victim to this horrendous beast. The creature resided in these woods. It hunted people down. The thought alone made me shudder. When the local law enforcement finally arrived on their ATVs, they listened solemnly as I rehashed my story with them. They were all too well acquainted with reports of such a horrifying creature terrorizing people. The officers notified nearby towns about the incident and advised everyone they met to avoid going into the woods alone or unprotected. They also organized patrols during both daytime and nighttime hours in an attempt to prevent any further attacks. Despite their best efforts and thorough search of the area where these attacks occurred, no trace of the beast could be found. The patrols continued for days, but eventually they began to dwindle. It seemed as though the creature had vanished or was in hiding. But the haunting memory of that gruesome attack remained fresh in my mind. My restless nights were filled with insomnia and nightmares, replaying vivid images of the mangled victims and tortured screams echoing through the forest. The one person I thought of every day was my dear friend Sam, who had been one of the first victims his bereaved family still in mourning and seeking answers. I decided to pack up my things and move away from the seemingly cursed woods. No longer would I call that cabin my home. No longer would I risk my life living within those sinister trees' clutches. Months went by, and people eventually stopped talking about the gruesome attacks. Life returned to normal in those small towns surrounding the woods. But that didn't mean anyone took the local authorities' warnings lightly. One day, I received a call from a former neighbor who lived close to my old cabin. His voice sounded grim as he shared his gruesome discovery and mutilated deer carcass in his backyard. The memory of past incidents came flooding back as an icy dread gripped my heart. As much as I tried to escape that place and its horrors, the knowledge that this creature was still out there left an unshakable fear deep within me. No matter how far away I moved or how hard I tried to suppress those memories, I knew it would never be over until that abomination was caught or killed. Yet, as long as it roamed free, it remained a chilling reminder, for so many grieving families and me, that true evil exists among us.
My name is Nathaniel Bishop, and I've recently found myself living in a quaint little cabin nestled in the heart of Grand Teton National Park, Wyoming. My reason for moving here? Well, I must say, I was simply tired of the hectic city life and longed for tranquility coupled with spectacular views. At first, life was idyllic far better than I had anticipated. Mornings were quiet and still, followed by afternoons exploring the park's breathtaking vistas. The fresh air invigorated me as I traversed the various trails surrounded by an explosion of wild flowers and towering trees. One evening while enjoying a cold beer on my front porch, my new neighbor Todd Campbell stopped by to introduce himself. He, like myself, had come to escape the chaos of urban life and had been living here for two years. Nate, it's great to have you around, Todd said as we shared a hearty handshake. You know, apart from us and a few others scattered throughout the park, it's just old Maureen Wilson down by Lake Solitude. We chatted for a while about fishing spots and hiking trails until the sun dipped below the horizon and darkness fell. Todd was about to head back home when his demeanor changed dramatically he eyed me seriously out of nowhere. Listen, Nate, he began with a furrowed brow. There's something you should know that might sound strange. He hesitated before continuing. It might just be an old wives' tale or some sort of local superstition, but some folk around here claim there's something lurking in these woods. I chuckled at his words. You're kidding me, I said dismissively. Todd frowned but didn't press further on the matter. We said our goodbyes in that chilling quiet transaction and parted ways. However, despite his ominous warning, I didn't give much thought to the supposed creature of the forest. To me, it was nothing more than folklore conjured by bored mountain dwellers. A couple of weeks later, as I lay in bed struggling to fall asleep, I heard a faint rustling outside my cabin. I chalked it up to a common woodland critter and tried to ignore it as I counted sheep. The following day, while hiking near Jenny Lake, I stumbled upon a rather dreadful scene that shook me to the core. The ground had been torn apart, almost as if a giant creature had been clawing at the earth. The strangest part was that there were no footprints or any indication of what could have caused such devastation. When I shared this discovery with Todd, he turned white as a ghost. It's her, he murmured, almost inaudibly. The creature from the woods, she's real. Skeptical but unnerved nonetheless, I decided to investigate further. As we were not police officers or investigators, we relied on our instincts and pooled knowledge from books on animal behavior. After much brainstorming and deliberations between myself and Todd, we came across information about an incredibly fast and deadly creature known for its agility and ruthlessness. What they called it varied through different sources some believed it could change forms like a shapeshifter but all were clear about one thing, its intentions were always sinister. As the days rolled by and tension quickly gripped my bones in fear despite my inclination to brush off Todd's warnings beforehand. On the other hand, my stubbornness did not recede either. The evidence seemed circumstantial at best. On one fateful night while returning from an after-dinner hike up Cascade Canyon Trail with Todd, we crossed paths with another hiker who mentioned they spotted something unusual by Lake Solitude. He appeared truly terrified like he couldn't quite articulate what he'd seen. We should check it out. Todd suggested urgently as we escorted the shaken hiker to his cabin. But only if you're ready, Nate. I nodded. Lake Solitude was where Maureen Wilson lived, after all, and I felt a rush of fear for her safety. Little did I know that setting foot near those murky waters would change the course of my life forever. As Todd and I approached the shore, 
we saw something rippling in the water, a terrifying monstrosity that defied imagination and logic. The creature emerged from the water, its large, scaly body glistening in the moonlight. It had menacing eyes that seemed to glow red, and rows of sharp teeth that could tear through flesh with ease. It moved gracefully despite its massive size, as though it had been stalking its prey for years. Todd and I froze at the sight of this monstrous being. We exchanged a glance, unsure of what to do or who to call for help. Our hearts pounding, we reluctantly decided to make a run for our safe cabin nearby. As we turned to leave, the creature lunged forward, with a guttural roar echoing through the valley. We sprinted feeling the ground shaking beneath us as the creature chased us with incredible speed. I couldn't fathom how something so massive could move so rapidly without collapsing under its own weight. As we neared our cabin, Todd tripped over a tree root and fell hard onto the ground, his face scrunching up in undeniable pain. I hesitated for just a moment, wanting to help him but fearing for my own life as well. Go! Just go! Todd shouted as he struggled to stand up. I looked into his eyes and saw genuine fear mixed with determination, pushing me to continue running. Tears in my eyes, I left Todd behind and made it back to our cabin where I frantically searched for something, anything, that could help. My phone had no signal in this remote area so I couldn't call the police or any other rescue services. Just then, I heard a blood-curdling scream coming from the direction I had left Todd only moments earlier. A wave of guilt washed over me. I should have stayed and helped him instead of running like a coward. Then the cabin door flew open and there stood Todd, battered and bruised but alive. He had managed to fight off the creature enough to make it to safety. Others weren't so lucky, Todd would explain later. The creature, it appeared, had been targeting hikers and campers in the area, leaving a trail of missing people and dismembered bodies. Maureen, who lived by Lake Solitude, had been one of the victims, though her body was never found. In the following days, Todd and I put up a good fight to warn others about the danger lurking in the woods around Cascade Canyon Trail. But people refused to believe us, dismissing our claims as nothing more than wild stories conjured up by traumatized hikers. Eventually, we left the area and tried to move on with our lives. The weight of seeing that creature and knowing what it had done would never leave us entirely. We couldn't forget those who had lost their lives in such a gruesome manner, Maureen, our fellow hiker near Lake Solitude, and the countless others that remained unaccounted for. Years later, Todd still carried a deep burden of guilt for not being able to save them or convince others of the true danger that lurked near Lake Solitude. And though we could no longer see that monster's glistening scales or piercing red eyes in person, its haunting presence would remain etched in our minds forever. Most importantly, we would remember each person who had crossed paths with this terrible beast and hope that no one else would ever experience the same terror we did. It was just another Saturday night watching the game on TV when the unthinkable happened. Football was always a great escape from everyday life, a welcome distraction. It was just me and my best friend, Henry, shouting at the screen now and then when our team made a bad play or scored big. As the clock ticked on, we headed into halftime and decided to grab a couple of cold beers from the fridge. As we sipped our ice-cold beverages, wincing at the sharp bitter taste, and shared jokes about the referees in the game, an odd humming sound caught my attention. Henry seemed oblivious to it, so I assumed it must have been my imagination playing tricks on me. The noise grew louder over time, becoming difficult to ignore. 
Hey man, do you hear that? I asked. Heard what? Henry replied with a puzzled look. I strained my ears and waited for it to start again nothing. Forget it, he said with a chuckle as he settled into his chair. Just as Henry cracked another joke about how useless our team's defensive line was, an ear-piercing crash shook the cabin walls. We both jumped up and quickly scanned each other for signs of injury. Thankfully, either of us sustained any. What in God's name was that? I wondered aloud. Henry frowned. Let's go outside and see what's going on. We cautiously stepped outside onto the porch. My eyes darted around nervously, searching for movement across dense woody terrain that encapsulated our cabin in northern Alabama. I don't see anything, said Henry. Our eyes caught something bulky lying nearby. Curiosity took over and pulled us forward when fear should have held us back. What we found on inspection resembled some kind of animal. Its tough hide had patches missing like it was eaten away by acid or burned off by fire. What happened to this thing? I asked, swallowing bile that crept up. No clue. Let's get back inside. That night's sleep eluded us. I lay on my bed, staring at the ceiling, unable to get those unsettling images out of my mind. The idea of two grown men getting unnerved by something so inexplicable struck me as odd, even comical in some ways. We shared our theories throughout the night, but none seemed plausible. The next evening brought an uneasy calm as we tried to go back to life as usual pretending not to notice the air of tension that hung over us. After a few hours of attempts at conversation and enjoying the game, the door rattled violently under heavy blows. The force was unnerving. It made the room rumble beneath our feet. Who in the world could that be? Henry asked. We should peek through the windows, I suggested. Cautiously moving towards the glass panes, I tried to steal a glimpse, when suddenly a grotesque claw-like hand scraped harshly against them. Darkness rendered its body difficult to see. However, its piercing eyes gleamed with a wicked intensity. The creature towered over us with an imposing height that dwarfed even our tallest visitors previously seen at the cabin. Henry stumbled back and grabbed a hunting rifle from under the sofa cushions, his voice trembling as he whispered harshly. We need to defend ourselves. I slowly nodded in agreement, my legs unsteady beneath me. As Henry loaded his rifle, keeping one eye on the door and now shuddering under each strike from the creature pounding it down, I searched for anything that could serve as a makeshift weapon. My fingertips brushed against the handle of a hefty cast iron skillet an ideally brutal tool for close encounters or self-defense, so I took it in my shaky grasp. The smell of hot iron filled my nostrils and proper grip was hard to keep as my hands were sweaty out of fear. The monster outside let out a hair-raising shriek, growing ever more impatient. The cabin's thin door now creaked under the strain of its ceaseless blows. The moment was near. Our hearts weighed heavily as we prepared for battle. The creature unleashed another ear-piercing screech, and it was clear that the door wouldn't hold much longer. We were cornered, and there was nowhere left to run. Should we call for help? I asked Henry, struggling to keep my voice from wavering. No time, he said through gritted teeth. And besides, who would even believe us? With every monstrous strike against the door, splinters of wood flew across the room. I glanced around, searching for any possible escape routes but found none. The windows were too small for either of us to fit through, and the creature had already blocked off the main entrance. Suddenly, Henry got an idea, or at least a mad attempt at one. There's a back exit through the storage room. He whispered urgently. Follow me. 
We crept quickly and quietly to the storage room as the creature continued its assault on the door. Upon entering, we both spotted the exit obscured behind stacks of old crates and boxes. We began moving them away from the narrow passage with haste. This was our only shot at survival. As we made our way through the cramped passage towards freedom, a loud crash resounded back in the main room. The creature had broken down the door. We were out of time. Our hearts pounded in our chests as we raced to put as much distance between us and it as possible. Suddenly, another guttural roar echoed through the cabin. Adrenaline surged through us both as we burst out of the storage room exit into dark thicket of woods that surrounded it. The air was thick with tension as we prepared ourselves to fend off an attack from the relentless creature behind us. Although its shape was still cloaked in darkness, its formidable size could not be hidden. Nothing about this thing seemed natural or something that belonged to this world. Its shoulders heaved with every breath it took as its eyes locked onto us with predatory intent. Henry aimed his rifle in the creature's direction firing off multiple rounds, each one making it flinch but not faltering in its menacing approach. Out of bullets and nearing panic, he hurled the empty rifle at it, buying us more time to keep moving. Running blindly through dense vegetation wasn't ideal, but it was our only option. The creature slashed and snarled ferociously behind us, never far enough away to make us feel out of danger. After what felt like an eternity, we stumbled upon a clearing just as the creature caught up to us. Cornered again and out of options, I clutched the cast iron skillet tighter as Henry tried desperately to reload his rifle. The creature lurched towards us but suddenly stopped in its tracks. Its intense gaze seemed fixated on something beyond the clearing. As we watched in frozen terror, Another monstrous figure appeared on the opposite end. The two creatures began stalking towards each other, snarling and sizing each other up, as if claiming territory or competing for a meal, that meal being us. In the midst of their confrontation, they seemed to have forgotten about their prey, giving us an opportunity. We need to go. Now! I uttered between heavy breaths. Henry nodded in agreement, and we took advantage of their momentary distraction to slip into the shadows undetected. We continued running through the woods as fast our legs could carry us until the sounds of battle faded away into silence. Exhausted and shaken, we reached a small highway where a passing truck driver spotted us and offered assistance. Our escape from that nightmare would not be easily forgotten. Even talking about it proved difficult. Who'd believe such an impossible tale? Though Henry survived the harrowing ordeal alongside me, he was racked with survivor's guilt over those who lost their lives that night in those woods. In the months that followed, we mourned the friends we'd lost and attempted to rebuild our lives. While the haunting memories remained, we both carved out a new existence for ourselves knowing that facing down such unimaginable horrors had given us a newfound perspective on life, pushing on in memory of those no longer with us. Though our nightmare was over, those grotesque creatures continued to roam the shadows of the wilderness, waiting for their next victims. Fifteen years ago, I decided to trade my cramped city life for a quiet existence tucked inside my own personal slice of a remote forest. My name is Marcus, and I'm currently residing in Delawaxen Forest, Pennsylvania. Funny thing about the woods, they may seem quiet to some, but once here you realize there's a cacophony of sounds that harmonize together into a symphony unknown to city folk. The first few months felt like an extended camping trip as I settled into my out-of-the-way cabin. Life was idyllic, 
filled with campfires and evenings relaxing on the porch conversing with the fireflies. Those were blissful days, uncontaminated by dread or uncertainty. All that changed on an unforgettable evening when the last embers of twilight blended with the creeping darkness. A friend named Sam was visiting at the time. He had driven up from Philly for the weekend. Our plan was simple, some hiking, grilling a steak or two, an ideal way to escape his stressful job, if just for a short while. We spent the day exploring the forest together, getting lost in nature and finding our way back home just before the sun dipped below the horizon. Sam had been going on about his boss getting on his nerves again when we noticed something out out of the corner of our eyes. Deep claw marks etched into one of the trees near my cabin. Each gash was long and vicious, much bigger than any animal I'd ever come across in these woods. They seemed unnaturally large, and we joked that perhaps it was Bigfoot saying hello from his secret hideout. We found humor in the spectacle until we heard a sound, unlike any other we'd ever experienced. A peculiar howl slashed through the air in a frequency that seemed to penetrate our very beings. It resembled metal scraping against nails as it reverberated off every surface. My cabin soon felt more like a cage than a sanctuary. We stared out the window, trying to catch a glimpse of what could be responsible for such an unnatural sound. The light was fading quickly in the dimming twilight, casting strange shapes on the forest floor from the shadows of enormous oaks and maples. Sam and I were putting steaks on the grill when a sudden, swift motion caught my attention on one side of the clearing. A thick bush convulsed, causing ripples to travel through it. Right at that moment, Sam noticed it too. Our eyes locked and widened with shock as we began piecing together the gravity of our situation. As we stared out into the gloom, what may have been minutes though felt like hours passed until our eyes adjusted, and we could make out a creature standing tall among the trees. It seemed to be studying us, almost as if deciding whether we were worth its time. The fingers that hung from its hands were elongated, tipped with sharp claws that dripped something dark and viscous. The beast's eyes were pitch black as its slender snout sniffed at the air between us and it. Scale-like skin covered its body with spines protruding down its ridge-like back. A malevolent aura emanated from this unholy being which sent shivers along my arms, rooting me to the spot. Sam seemed likewise affected. His once deep breaths had become shallow puffs of air misting in the night. Taking a step forward, the creature's long legs bent ever so slightly, each movement deliberate and quiet despite its size. My heart hammered against my ribs as I realized it was slowly advancing toward us. Marcus, Sam whispered so softly that I could barely hear him over my own breathing. We need to get inside now. I grabbed Sam's arm and we ran back into the cabin, slamming the door behind us. Our only thought was to barricade ourselves in and hope that whatever it was wouldn't be able to get inside. We need to call for help, I whispered, my voice barely audible. Sam shook his head. No reception here, remember? He gestured at his useless phone. We hadn't expected to need help during our relaxing trip in the woods. Now we were alone with an ungodly creature hunting us. We locked windows, pushed furniture against the doors, and took what little defensive weapons we had, a baseball bat and a kitchen knife. We agreed our best chance was to hide in the small attic and wait until dawn when hopefully we could make a run for the car and escape. As we huddled together in the attic, every creak of the floorboards or gust of wind seemed like another harbinger of doom. We glanced at each other but couldn't communicate our fears without enhancing our terror. Then it came, an ear-splitting sound split through the quiet night air. The creature had made its way onto the porch. 
The door shuddered under powerful, relentless blows as it clawed its way through our makeshift barricade. Utter panic took hold of us as we silently decided on our next move. The sound of splintering would echo through the cabin. It had broken through the door. Forced into action by fear and desperation, I cracked open a window and peered out, while Sam manned our meager arsenal. Outside, I saw a thicket of bushes not too far from us that could offer some cover until dawn. Let's jump out this window and make a run for those bushes. I whispered urgently to Sam. It's our best chance. Sam nodded resolutely, gripping his knife tighter. We opened the window quietly. I squeezed through first, landing nimbly on the soft soil. Sam followed but lost his grip, crashing to the ground with a stifled scream. We scrambled to our feet and sprinted for the bushes, while behind us the creature let out a deafening roar. Once inside the cover of bushes, we lay silently, barely daring to breathe. But it had heard us. We listened as it rushed through the cabin and soon saw its twisted figure emerging from the destroyed doorway. Our blood ran cold as its black eyes scanned the area. How would it react when it found Sam's dropped knife? The sun began to rise slowly over the horizon, casting eerie shadows across the landscape that mimicked the elongated limbs of the monster before us. It picked up Sam's knife. A guttural growl emanated from its throat. As if sensing our presence, its gaze snapped towards our hiding place. There was no stopping it now. Our only choice was to run. I grabbed Sam's hand, praying we'd make it to the car in time. Bursting out of the undergrowth, our legs pumped hard as we raced for our lives. The creature let out another chilling roar and began pursuit. The car seemed impossibly far away as we sprinted through the woods, branches tearing at our clothes, exhaustion clouding our judgment. As luck would have it, we reached the car just moments ahead of our pursuer, fumbling with keys and trembling hands. The engine roared to life and we sped off just as the creature crashed into the side of our vehicle with an ear-splitting screech. Breathing heavily from adrenaline and relief, we sped away from that nightmarish place without looking back. Days later, now safe in our city apartment and trying to process what had happened during that horrifying trip, we couldn't shake our brush with death or bring ourselves to share this story with anyone else. The scars we bore from that encounter with the unspeakable creature in the woods merely served as a chilling reminder of our close call. Realizing we could never return to that place, we agreed never to let our guard down and to cherish the seconds life kept us from mortal danger. That narrow escape became an indelible lesson about the unpredictable, merciless force lurking at the edge of reason. After a long day of working on my cabin, I decided to head into town, which was nestled deep within the forest of the Pacific Northwest. My name is Tanner Bolt, and I had moved to this remote location a few months ago to escape the chaos of city life. Living alone in this secluded environment definitely had its ups and downs, but the serenity I found amidst the towering trees was unmatched. Today was just another routine trip for supplies. I hopped in my battered pickup truck and took off down the dusty gravel road. The sun was already beginning its descent below the horizon as I made my way into town. Along the way, I passed my neighbor, Paul, who was on a walk with his dog Bowser. Hey there, Tanner! Nice weather we're having today, huh? He shouted toward me as I slowed down to roll my window down. Yeah, it really is beautiful out here. I replied with a smile as Bowser wagged his tail happily. Surprisingly, he didn't bark at me once like yesterday when he mistook me for a piece of fried chicken left outside. 
We both laughed it off and continued our separate ways. As I walked into the small country store in town, Smith's Grocery, I noticed that everyone seemed a bit more on edge than normal. Audrey and Gilbert Melivore spoke in hushed tones near the produce aisle. Something about bloodstains appearing on their back porch last night. Out of politeness and an unsure feeling in my gut, I dropped eavesdropping and went about shopping. Upon returning to my cabin carrying groceries inside, I noticed some odd marks in the dirt near my truck. Had something stumbled upon my property while I was away? They resembled animal tracks but were much larger than any animal typically found around here. My curiosity peaked. However, I made a mental note to be more cautious. Several hours later, I drifted off to sleep with the sound of crickets chirping and owls hooting outside my window. A loud crash jolted me awake in the middle of the night. Heart hammering against my rib cage. I grabbed a flashlight and cautiously made my way outside to see what had caused the noise. The sight that greeted me was truly horrifying. The front end of my pickup truck was completely destroyed, as if an enraged beast had torn into it with powerful claws. Shattered glass from the windshield littered the ground, reflecting the light from my flashlight like tiny shards of ice. At that moment, a guttural screech echoed through the forest, the source unknown but far too close for comfort. As I turned back toward my cabin, I caught a glimpse of something, or someone, moving among the trees. The moonlight illuminated its dark silhouette just enough for me to make out a few details. It appeared humanoid, but much taller than any person I'd ever seen. It's long, Thin limbs seemed to bend at unnatural angles as it gracefully moved between the trees, while its large hands were tipped with razor-sharp claws that glinted in the light. For a brief second, our eyes locked, its cold, unblinking gaze boring into my very soul. Panic rose within me like hot bile as I stumbled backward and fumbled with the cabin door. Before I knew it, I was inside again quickly locking every entry point while grabbing my phone to call for help. My trembling fingers punched in 9-11, waiting for an operator to answer on what felt like an eternity. I waited on the line, breathing deeply, trying to stay calm. The 911 operator picked up. 911, what's your emergency? She asked. There's a creature outside my cabin. I said, voice shaking. It destroyed my truck, and I think it's trying to get inside. Stay on the line with me, the operator instructed. I'm sending someone now. Can you describe the creature? All I could remember were those long limbs and wicked claws. It's tall, maybe seven or eight feet, with long arms and legs, I said. It has huge hands with sharp claws. Stay inside and keep the doors locked, she advised. Help is on the way. As we continued talking, a sudden crash startled me. It sounded like it had come from the back of the cabin. Fear crawled up my spine as I realized this creature was relentless in its pursuit. The next few minutes felt like hours as I anxiously awaited help. Finally, I heard sirens in the distance. They were getting closer. A wave of relief washed over me as the creature appeared to stop its efforts to enter my cabin. Police officers arrived and cautiously surveyed the scene. The destruction of my truck was clear evidence that something had attacked, but there was no sign of the creature anywhere. They searched the area surrounding my cabin but found nothing. In an attempt to provide some answers, an undisclosed specialist was brought in to examine everything thoroughly, though I couldn't help but feel we were dealing with something utterly unexplainable. With no other choice given and having exhausted their options, the police could only advise me to leave while they continued their investigation. 
feeling unsafe and with no desire to remain in that cabin a moment longer, I packed a bag and left within hours. The unidentifiable nature of what attacked me haunted me for days afterward, always looking over my shoulder, wondering if it would come back for me. I stayed with a friend in town, thankful for their generous hospitality and comforting presence. Weeks turned into months, and eventually, the incident began to drift towards the back of my mind. The police never found the creature or determined what it was, but it never returned, at least as far as I knew. There were no further reports of attacks or sightings in the area, leaving me with a lingering uncertainty. Eventually, I moved away from that cabin and the surrounding woods altogether, unwilling to put myself at risk again. A new life awaited me in a more populated area where the terror of that night wouldn't haunt me any longer. Sometimes, when sleep eludes me at night, I find myself reflecting on those horrific events. That single brush with terror left an indelible mark on my memory and perception of safety, reminding me always to be aware and vigilant. In those moments of recollection, I wonder if that creature is still out there somewhere, lurking in those woods, waiting for another victim to cross its path. And though we'll likely never know the truth behind its existence or motivations, perhaps it's better left as an unsolved mystery, a chilling reminder of nature's wrath and latent ferocity. Life was simple for Ethan Snow, living in a quiet cabin nestled within the dense woodlands of Vermont. With miles separating him from civilization, his days consisted of chopping wood and tending to the vegetable garden. Although Ethan enjoyed solitude and nature's serenity, there were times when he questioned the wisdom of residing in such isolation. One day, while going about his typical chores, he stumbled upon an abandoned backpack atop a rock formation. Surprisingly, the bag was soaked in blood. Shocked and intrigued, Ethan couldn't help but investigate further. Sifting through the contents, he discovered items belonging to a group of ambitious hikers, maps, trail mix, and a camera that made him cringe when he reviewed the photos it contained. The images began innocuously enough, typical snapshots of friends enjoying a nature excursion. However, as Ethan clicked through them, they became increasingly horrifying. Disfigured bodies mangled beyond recognition littered the forest floor. Despite his desire to call for help in these inexplicable circumstances, he found himself without cell reception or any means of communication. Ethan decided it was best to return home and wait out nightfall before venturing into town for assistance. He could hardly forget what he'd found. Every creak of branches outside caused him to jump from his seat by the window. Late that same evening, he spotted a figure lurching through the trees toward his cabin. It wasn't human nor any well-known animal. It had knobby limbs and twisted horns atop its distorted head as if formed from God's fury or man's malice. Frozen in terror at this grotesque aberration of nature, Ethan watched as it approached with slow determination towards his dwelling. As it came nearer and nearer, its movements became more erratic, muscles contorting unnaturally beneath its sinewy hide, claws scraping against tree trunks. Unable to sit still any longer, Ethan gripped his hunting rifle and took aim at the beast. He cursed his trembling hands as he squeezed the trigger. Instead of dropping dead at his doorstep, the creature's tortured gaze locked onto his. The abomination let out a gut-wrenching screech as if in defiance of its own agony. That's when Ethan noticed the scars, burn marks, and fresh wounds strewn across its body the recognition of pain dealt unto it by others before him. Their standoff dragged into what felt like an eternity until, finally, 
The mutilated being broke eye contact and disappeared back into the dark expanse of trees. A torrent of sweat cascaded down Ethan's brow, panic gripping him tighter than ever before. Frantically searching for his keys as he prepared to flee, Ethan was interrupted by a sudden pounding on his door. The knocking sent tremors throughout his entire home and shattered all pretenses of security. A familiar voice called out from behind the door, pleading to be let in. Ethan! Please, you have to help us. It's still out there. Fear prevented Ethan from answering right away as he racked his brain for any connection to that voice amidst these abnormal circumstances. Slowly opening the door, he found Jordan Mitchell, an acquaintance from town who had joined a hiking group with friends days prior, deducing that they were the unfortunate individuals pictured on that ill-fated camera. Jordan was exhausted and terror-stricken, her clothes torn and stained with blood, some her own, some belonging to her friends whose whereabouts were yet unknown. She begged Ethan for help while providing a puzzling description of their attacker which matched the malformed monster he had encountered earlier. Suddenly, a cacophony of otherworldly screeching shattered their tenuous safety. The creature leaped full force at Jordan in a visceral display of strength and insatiable hunger. In that instant, Ethan knew what had pursued those innocent young hikers into this wilderness and condemned them to a gruesome fate. Jordan, now firmly in the jaws of the monster, let out an excruciating shriek as the bloodthirsty creature gripped her tightly, pain searing across her features. With no time to lose, Ethan aimed his gun at what he could only describe as his worst nightmare come to life, knowing full well the consequences of a mistimed or misplaced shot. I steadied my hand, focused on the creature, and pulled the trigger. The gun roared, and the bullet found its target. It hobbled, momentarily stunned but far from defeated, then lunged at Jordan again. This time, I didn't hesitate. Another shot rang out. Wounded twice but still relentless, the creature turned its attention towards me. Its bloodshot eyes seethed with hatred, punctuated by its gnarled teeth, and matted fur stained with gore. This was not a mindless beast. This was a harbinger of death and destruction. In a blind panic, I fired at it again and again, the cacophony of gunshots almost deafening. At last, the monstrous being crumpled to the ground with a guttural groan. Panting heavily, I stared at its motionless body sprawled on the forest floor. I quickly approached Jordan, who lay battered and bruised after her encounter with death itself, but she was alive. We didn't have much time. We knew that this nightmare would not end until we were both far away from this godforsaken place. In desperate need of help, we managed to reach Ethan's truck in a stumbling sprint. I raced through my contact list in search of someone who would believe our harrowing tale, and maybe save others from the creature's wrath. My fingers settled on Sheriff Miller's contact information. He had always been a compassionate man for whom this small town came first. Another one? This has to stop. His voice crackled over the phone as he listened to our story in disbelief. Stay where you are. We're sending an armed unit to your location. As we waited for help to arrive, we clung to each other like frightened children in the night. Despite our fear of what might happen if the creature returned or if more like it were lurking in the shadows, the knowledge that help was on its way calmed our shattered nerves. When the sheriff and his armed men finally arrived, they cautiously approached the scene while we relayed our chilling story. As they listened, their concern turned to shock as I turned in my phone their way, the exclusive picture of its gruesome form on display. This was something no one had ever seen, something that defied reason and sent shivers down their spines. Forensic teams scoured the area for any evidence and clues about the origins of the mysterious creature. 
The creature's body was taken away for further study. Its reign of terror had come to an end. The officers pledged to do everything in their power to protect not just us but those who might stumble across any other unknown horrors that lay hidden within the woods. The following weeks saw an increased law enforcement presence patrolling all untamed places surrounding the town, seeking to prevent any more tragedies from occurring. Vigilance became our watchword, bound together by a primal fear not wholly understood nor explained. As life went on, I couldn't shake the weight of what had happened. The deaths of those who crossed paths with that abomination haunted me, their faces forever etched into my mind as stark reminders of how fragile life could be. The creature may have been defeated, but should there ever be another, burdened by sorrow and regret, I knew I could never again ignore such danger or return to life as it once was. It eventually became clear that our world hid dark secrets within its depths, waiting for any unsuspecting soul to wander too far from safety. And while this particular nightmare had ended for now, there remained a question on everyone's mind, what else lies hidden in these dark expanses? Only time would tell if answers were within reach or if new horrors waited, eager to emerge and claim more victims. For now, we clung to life and to each other. We mourned for the ones we lost, Jordan's friends and other potential victims of the creature. Their senseless end was a painful reminder of the evil that lurked when least expected, our small world shattered by the horrors born in its depths. And yet, despite it all, life found a way to go on, as it always would. The harsh reality that darkness could find us at any moment stayed close, but no longer paralyzing. And even if there was no accounting for future terrors, we stood united and firm, ready to face whatever came next.